Man is his own star, and the soul that can render an honest and perfect man commands all light, all influence, all fate. Nothing to him falls early or too late. Our acts our angels are, or good or ill, our fatal shadows that walk by us still. Cast the bantling on the rocks, suckle him with the she-wolf's teat, wintered with the hawk and fox, power and speed be hands and feet. Welcome to the Emerson Tapes. This is a podcast series with me, Lobo, and Tiger. In this series, we're going to go over some of our favorite Emerson works, share insights we got from them, share the lessons and ways we've been able to apply them in real life. And for the first podcast, we're going to go over a classic work. I've actually had this work linked in my bio since I joined Twitter, and that essay is self-reliance. This is uh, this is definitely one of my favorite of his works. It's very uh, it's very clear. It's not very uh, you know, it doesn't get you get very highfalutin. And you'll notice throughout this whole cast, you'll realize Emerson speaks on and diagnoses perfectly the exact same issues that you know we see every single day on the internet and in modern society. There's nothing new under the sun with this guy. It is, it's, it's actually very eye-opening when you read it. Yeah, that's one of the best things that I've taken away from this, or one of the things I've noticed most is just how applicable everything is to today's times. You know, nothing is, has really changed. The nature of man remains the same. History is cyclical, even though the events are random. But overall, the structure remains the same. And there's a passage in here that reminds me of this, but life is kind of organized chaos. There's an order and structure to it, to all these random events and happenings. Mm -hmm. And in self-reliance, we'll see a lot of the same themes of things that we're dealing with today about people following the crowd, people not listening to their inner voice, people looking uh to other people to get all of their cues and views on life and on the world so so what i actually want to do is i want to start in the second paragraph because i think the first sentence of the second paragraph kind of sets the whole stage and then we can go back to some of the stuff in the first lines but it, it the second paragraph opens there is a time in every man's education when he arrives at the conviction that envy is ignorance, that imitation is suicide, that he must take himself for better, for worse, as his portion, that though the wide universe is full of good, no kernel of nourishing corn can come to him, but through his toil bestowed on that plot of ground, which is given him to till. Right, and right away, this passage is like, you know, this is like the most high level of the high level that any any modern self-improvement book basically gets to this point. And, and Emerson does this in like the second paragraph of just one of his essays. And, you know, like we, we're on earth, right? We have all, you know, especially with modern, you know, social media and stuff like that. We have all these different distractions. We have all these different things that are pulling us. You know, Emerson goes later into travel and things like that. We have all these things that we could do, but at the end of the at the end of the day, you know, we are a limited being inside of a limited body designed to face and overcome challenge. And we basically have to we have to basically go through life with what we're given from birth, and you know, ascend to these challenges. And that's 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 all we can do. That's all we can do. We can't transcend our limitations. We can only try to and only and only get closer to, but we can never fully transcend them. Yeah. In the intro, the thing that strikes me the most is how he makes a few attempts to talk about how we have this inner voice inside of us that is good and it's great, but it's the thing that we don't listen to enough. You know, he said uh, earlier a few a few 
a paragraph earlier in the beginning, in the first paragraph, he says, familiar as the voice of the mind is to each, the highest merit we ascribe for Moses, Plato, and Milton is they set at naught books and traditions and spoke not what men, but what they thought. So they ignored the great men that we honor and look up to. They ignored what other people thought and were in tune with their own voice. And he says, a man should learn to detect and watch the gleam of light which flashes across his mind from within. And that's what these great men follow. And, and this is another key part, he says. He said, yet he dismisses without notice his thought because it's his. In every work of genius, we recognize our rejected thoughts. They come back to us with a certain alienated majesty. So what that kind of reminds me of is he's talking about you ever see like a tweet go viral and you're like, oh my God, that's so true, right? That's what he's, <laughs> we've all had that. In every work of genius, he's saying we, we recognize our own rejected thoughts. So a lot of the difference between some of the great men and even the people on the internet who get a lot of influence is a characteristic is they're free, they're carefree and they speak their mind and they speak their thoughts. You know, a lot of people have told me before, they said, I felt this before, but I've never been able to put it into words, right? And what that is, why I'm able to put, put it into words is because I watch the gleam of light when it flashes across my mind, right? Like I know how that when I'm feeling certain things that it's real and that it's a message to me from my intuition to define that which I'm experiencing. And what happens is a lot of us stifle that voice. We try to outsource it. We want it to come from people that we view as equal or greater to ourselves and not realizing that the same greatness is within us. Well, that, and, that's the thing. We, we have this voice, right? And, and it's almost like we want to listen to it when we feel like it's safe. That's what, that's our inner instinct. Like we want to, we want to hold the cool opinions, but only when it's cool right but what greatness is is you you say that thing you do that thing because you need to and you just know you, you have you're so connected to your divine intuition that you just know i need to say this thing because i'm so aligned with truth it has nothing to do with your social situation or you know you, the, the the groups you're in or anybody around you it's totally an internal sort of alignment yeah, not only do you need to say them, you have to say them. Uh, this is a point that he actually stresses on a few times in self-reliance is about how you have a duty to not only hear this voice, but to spread it. And he even says here, he's like, um, he's talking about the great men again. He said, they teach us to abide by our spontaneous impression with good humored inflexibility than most when the whole cry of voices on the other side says else tomorrow a stranger will say with masterly good sense precisely what we have thought and felt all the time and we shall be forced to take with shame our own opinion from another so what this really is talking about here he's like when you don't take that action somebody else is going to do it and you have to deal with the shame of knowing that you are afraid to take the first step you know it's kind of like when you're waiting at a crossroads on a street and like somebody has the courage to walk and then like 10 other people start walking yeah. down for one person yeah, so they're true. safe or it's like you ever see those videos of people at like a festival and nobody's dancing and then one, one person dancing. gets up and dancing then they're joined by another and they're joined by 15 others and maybe you'll be one of the people that joins but deep down inside there's a little bit of shame that you feel because one person had the courage to do what you were thinking about the whole time. Hmm. Right. And that's what this is all about is like these great men, they had the courage to say what everybody else felt and, and was experiencing and wanted to, but they took that step. And what happens is if you continuously um, ignore these, this intuition and this voice that you have that tells you, that gives you great insights or tell you to do great things, then you, you're basically living a passive life and you're going to have to wait to watch people do the things that you want to do and live in the way that you want to live and have the respect that you want to have, you know? So 
and this is something that's going on a lot today, on a lot in today's world, is that people are afraid to speak out. And what I'm noticing, especially with all the crazy times we live in, is that if you go and say something that's against the grain, a lot of people automatically jump up and agree with you. They're feeling the same thing, but it takes that one person that has the courage to cross the street first or has has the courage to go up and dance first or has the courage to go and talk to the girl first. So as a man, if you want to be considered a great man, you have to be that person that takes the chance first. And And it's, it's, it's easier than ever today to do that because you know, we, you can just tweet or go on social media and just post a short video and say something that everybody's thinking, but nobody wants to say back then, you know, in Emerson's time, you had to go on the stump. You had to, you know, get in front of the townspeople and you had to actually get face to face. And some of them might not like what you said. And some of them might, you know, resort to physical violence at that point. But this we you can immediately amass an army of people who agree with you and who've been trying to articulate what you, what you said in minutes, minutes. And those people will begin following you and begin associating with you right after that. It's, but, but equally at the same time, it's easy as hell now but also we have the weakest people probably in, you know, pre-Atlantean times that are just, you know, they're so terrified of speaking their minds for a variety of reasons, right? Social, corporate jobs, all these different things. And so, you know, if you are a man with guts and with, a, you know, a man with a chest, as C.S. Lewis would say, then it's really easy for you to make your mark right now. Really easy. There's a, there's a huge void that you can fill really easily. Yeah, and he, he even stresses a little more where it's like not only will you feel shame for not speaking your voice and not only will you not get the benefits that come with it, but also what happens is if, you, if you're if you not in tune with your t- intuition and you ignore it, it'll eventually leave you. And he talks about this a little bit later down. He says, God will not have his work made manifest by cowards. A man is relieved and gay when he has put his heart into his work and done his best. But what he has said or done otherwise shall give him no peace. It is a deliverance which does not deliver. In the attempt, his genius deserts him. No muse befriends, no invention, no hope. So when you're not in tune with this voice and you're not practicing pushing the uh, stepping over the line, and pushing yourself a little bit further and pushing your opinions out there and pushing your beliefs out there, when it's time for you to listen to your intuition or to speak the right words, you're not going to have them. It's like a muscle, right? So if like, if you're not using it, it atrophies. And then when you want to use it, you don't have it anymore. So you have a responsibility to speak your mind and your beliefs and your principles and your virtues because if you don't listen to that voice constantly that voice is going to stop speaking to you 100 percent, 100 percent. you can see it just in people's eyes today that they're just so disconnected from their intuition and you know the transcendent that you know it just makes it really easy for them to get manipulated yeah and um i even another key part that he talks about here where he talks about how children are powerful because they're in tune with this. Mm-hmm. You know, it's a part where he talks about the the nonchalance of boys who are sure of dinner, right? He says, looking out from his corner on people and facts as they pass by, the boy sentences them on their merits in the swift summary way of boys. He decides as if people are good, bad, interesting, silly, eloquent, or troubles- troublesome, but he cumbers himself never about the consequences He gives an independent, genuine verdict. You must court him. He does not court you. And uh, conversely, the man is clapped in jail by his own consciousness. As soon as he has once acted or spoken, he's a committed person, watched by the sympathy or hatred of hundreds, whose affections must now enter into his account. So he's talking about children, young boys. They're not afraid to say what they think and to make judgments and to stand by them. But the man has a, a hundred voices in his head. He's constantly thinking about what his wife is going to think about his views, what his boss and how his job might react right. to the way that he sees things. 
how his friends are going to feel about him if they see him go up and talk to a girl and get rejected. He's not listen. He's listening to all of the voices except his own. And this is why, you know, this, this is just a small tangent, but it makes that makes it incredibly sad when you see videos of children just like masked up in public school, just sitting there like dying inside and just getting told from an early age, all these really demoralizing and traumatizing things that just like that just wreck their childlike, you know, innocence. And by the time they get teenagers, you know, their that inner child is broken. It's like really hurt by then. Yeah, and like we all see the wrong around us, but we have to take the action on it. And you know, he says, "What what would a, what would a man be like if he could pass again into this neutrality? If he could avoid all pledges and having observed observe again from the unaffected, unbiased, unbribable, unafrightened innocence? You know, he would utter his opinions on all passing affairs." which being seen to not be private but necessary, would sink like darts into the ear of men and put them in fear. So he's talking about it. He had enough men that had this attitude of the young boy in terms of not being afraid about right. customs and before consequences. All this, before all the programming comes in. Their words would, would sink like darts into the ear of men and put them in fear. And this is actually goes into the censorship that there is today, right? You mm. have to have it. Because if you're allowed to have to have a, a um, open conversation where people can speak to the things that we know are true but are afraid to say, it'll sink them into people's hearts. And when you talk about put put them at fear, it puts the people in power at fear. Mm -hmm. Very because true. Because they can't compete with the truth. No. Because no. it resonates. Yeah, I mean it's one of those things. So I've noticed this more and more when you hear the truth. There's you literally can't do anything to to, to you, all you can do is push it away. You can't push. You can't say, oh, it's it's actually OK or oh, no, that's not real. Like once you hear the truth, even if you haven't verified it personally, you just feel it inside that. OK, that's right. That's right. Right. And yeah. You, you feel it. It's like it's so funny. Somebody sent me um, a DM the other day, it was some information about like when mRNA vaccines were created in like 2016. And they were like, did you know this? And my answer was no, but I didn't need to know to know. Yeah. Right. Yeah, exactly. So it's like, you just, once you see it, it's just like, oh, you can connect all these dots and you can see like, okay, this resonates at the vibration of truth because it sounds like all those, it connects to all those other truthful ideas out there and thoughts out there and information out there so yeah like Emerson says in the in the couple paragraphs before he says trust thyself every heart vibrates to that iron string and that's exactly what it feels like when you feel it feels like a resonance you know it's like a it's like somebody pulled that galactic guitar string right to your heart and you just feel okay that is true that is a lie that is true that is a lie you can just know once you're in tune you can discern very quickly yeah, it only takes a second. I've actually been talking about talking to people about this recently and how I don't really have to look, look with the whole refuse to look it up, you know, thing like that's real. Like, I don't have to look things up as much anymore just to understand. I can read a headline on something and see exactly what's going on, see the lie and see the truth. And it's because I'm so in custom of in a custom of speaking the truth in my in my life and and analyzing things from the most base level and saying what I feel about them and not being afraid of any sort of consequences or any sort of sh being shamed by other people. And yeah. And you can just tell right off the bat, you know, like you said with the headline, like, Oh, another attack. Oh, another, like another psychological operation. Oh, another, you know, manipulation scare. Right. It's like, we're just, we're in this constant, you know, we're in this constant interaction with this malevolent, abusive, like mainstream media complex thing that just won't go away. And, you know, you could, every time you see a headline, like you said, you can just immediately categorize it and you don't even need to read it. You can just categorize it as propaganda. Yeah. These are the voices which we hear in solitude, but they grow faint and inaudible as we enter the world. Society everywhere is a conspiracy against 
the manhood of every one of its members. Society is a joint stock company in which the members agree for the better securing of his bread to each shareholder to surrender the liberty and culture of the eater. The virtue in most requests is conformity. Self-reliance is its aversion. It loves not realities and creators, but names and customs. Now, doesn't that sound like today? Just a little bit. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> that's what it is, right? Like, we're this big, huge community, and we make these rules, or we agree to this unspoken set of rules to be able to exist as a functioning member of society, right? Like, that's how civilization is built. Uh, if you've ever seen or heard about the studies where they say people fear public speaking more than they fear death, well, why? It's because they fear embarrassment. And the fear, of, yeah, that's rooted in us because if you live in a small hunter-gatherer tribe of 20 people and you get embarrassed and you get ostracized and excommunicated from the group, that's basically a death sentence right so we're still dealing with that same programming in today's worlds where now we follow a lot of rules and customs that are for lack of better words bullshit right and we do it from the fear of being ostracized and excommunicated but what's crazy about today's world is we don't really need to be included to be able to survive anymore so we don't have to have that fear no, it's, 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 but you know, it's, it's very easy relative to other periods to get self-sustainable pretty easily. Um, and so, like you said, you know, you, if you have your material comforts, you have your immediate family comforts, you have your, you know, all that stuff going on and there should be no fear against speaking out against things you care about because all your stuff is taken care of. Yet we still have that nagging at us like a demon. Agreed. Whoso would be a man must be a nonconformist, right? That's like a very good sort of maxim, right? What, what is what is a true man in, in modern society is someone who doesn't conform to, to you know, the absurd, de- I, I call it tyranny by a thousand tiny rules, right? Thousand of tiny, ever-changing rules, socially, you know, financially, all the, you know, the, the thousands of, of, of things that we need to keep aware of. Somebody who doesn't care about those and who, you know, f- who, who transcends that in a sense um, and focuses on what, you know, c- finds the truth and finds the good and cuts through all that at, at the behest of, you know, his inner voice. That's a man. That's a man. Yeah, you can't be, he says you can't be hindered by the name of goodness but must explore if it be goodness. So instead of every, like all these things now, like inclusion and diversity, all these things that they tell us are good, we can't take that on face value. We have to inspect it and see if it's actually good, right? And he says, absolve you to yourself and you shall have the suffrage of the world. So what's actually crazy is if you are able to be self-reliant and to take a stand against things, you'll have the world will be on your side because that's who men respect and revere. They respect, they respect the man that has principles and stands behind them no matter what. I mean, that's what you, that, that isn't that your pin tweet, right? To be a friend, you must also be a worthy opponent, right? Yeah. It's, it's like, you know, if you're nice to me, but you're not, in the least bit dangerous to me in a sense like you can't you there's there's no way that there's no level that you can compete with me on or you know if we you know if if we ever turn enemies it wouldn't be like a a bad thing for me at some level then where's the value in the friendship as a man right your goodness must have some edge to it else it is none right you know that's like with the famous jordan peterson uh quote where he's like a good man is not a weak, non-dangerous man. It's a dangerous man that has it under control. Right, right. And that's very true. You know, if, true. if there's no strength in you, then showing humility just looks like weakness. Mm-hmm. Very true. And I mean, he, he goes further with that. 
No law can be sacred to me but that of my nature. Good and bad are but names very readily transferable to that or this. The only right is what is after my constitution. The only wrong, what is against it, right? And this is, you know, a lot of, like, I think a lot of people will misread this. Like, a lot, especially a lot of, like, people into hyper-degeneracy who, who haven't, like, fixed themselves yet and, like, you know, got, uh, they're not on a path of alignment. They're going to see, oh, my nature, right? Like, what, you know, it doesn't matter what I'm doing, you know, it, my truth, right? It's all about following my truth. No, 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 no. I don't think that's what he's saying, personally. I think it's about if you're aligned with truth and you're listening to your, your true nature, that's what your constitution is built upon. Because a lot of people, when they say my truth, they're actually talking about my lies that they tell themselves. They're not mm -hmm. actually, um, they're, they're, you know, they're, they're projecting, they're saying my truth, but you look at their life, they're drinking every weekend. They're having tons of like con like casual sex. They are like they have like ten bucks in their bank account. They can't keep a job. They have no super deep relationships. They you know they're constantly they're addicted to their phones and to media conditioning and whatnot. And they say, oh, because I went to a yoga retreat, I'm living out my truth. No, that's not what's happening. Yeah, I think what we've lost, and he actually talks about this later on, but we're living this world where we think everything is subjective and there are no objective truths like everything is is perception but it also isn't there are some things that are true like birds fly fish swim right like strength is strength weakness is weakness you know honor is honor right like there's certain things that are not just pers perspective there's a certain way of being that is superior and is more optimal and would lead to a better functioning society. So I think that's something that, um, and, and what's, what I think he's saying on a deeper level is when you're in tune with your inner voice, when you're in tune with nature and God, or other words, good, then it's easy to see the, the objective truths as opposed to just living in this state where you think everything is perception and maybe I'm wrong about this, but no, there are laws that govern the world and govern the universe. And those things are true. They're not someone's opinion or just how you view things. I like to frame it like this. You know, we, we live in an objective world with a subjective viewpoint. Yeah, because, that's perfect. Because we, we as ourselves, just because we are, I mean, just like the scientist thing, right? The scientist, is viewing everything through subjective lens. So in, in a good faith scientist uses methods and, in, you know, extra personal things to reach conclusions. Right. And we have this world that is clearly, you know, it's, it's clearly driven by laws far beyond our comprehension and we can only view it from our limited point. And I think it just takes, it takes a, a part of it too, is just humility, right? Hold it in understanding that we are subjective beings view in this objective world means that we don't know everything and we will never know everything and that there's no point to try to know everything and to try to beat down others it's just about learning and developing yourself which is the which is basically the whole point of this work i believe it's about development of yourself because the one thing you can know is yourself right and also to go back and talk about how you can be in tune with this universal truth he says right after he's talking about good and bad, he says, a man is to carry himself in the presence of all opposition as if everything were titular and ephemeral, but he. So titular means like a false authority. So like the government, like they appear like they have power over your life, but they actually don't. Or ephemeral means it doesn't last forever. It's temporary. So what you have to do is you got to look at these societies and these institutions and these badges and these names as if they're not real they're and they're not they're only stationary the only thing that's real is you and the inner voice and the experience that you're having it in life and how you're the truth that you see that's what's real not any of these uh fake authority systems or um idea ideologies that are seeping into people's minds like 
look at every single piece of opposition as if that's not the real truth, you know, and the real truth is what you get from your vertical connection with the universe. Well, G- Jesus, Jesus I, I'm struggling to place the quote, which is bad because I've been reading the New Testament every night for the past week. But Jesus said that we're in, we're we're you know, we're in battle not against you know principalities of the, of the earth, but in you know forces in heaven and what forces in heaven and hell, right? We're so every everybody down here on this earth level is nothing compared to what's going on on the on the grand universal scale. And if you have that perspective, and if you're aligned with that universal scale against people who are not, they have no power over you. There's nothing. They have nothing over you. All right, exactly, 100%. Going down, you know, as you said, your goodness must have some edge to it, else it is none. The doctrine of hatred must be preached as the counteraction of the doctrine of love when that pulls and whines. I shun father, mother, and wife, and brother when my genius calls me. So, I mean, what he's saying here is that, you know, there are some times when you need to get hard. There's some times when you need to have... Like you need to demonstrate that edge, even when, you know, your, your, your loved ones and your family and your surroundings, maybe they have good intentions, but they're displaying it and they're, they're, they want to hold you back. Right. That's a lot of, that's a lot of the growth of men is that we need to do things sometimes that only we understand in that moment and nobody else does. Maybe one or two very close male friends will, but nobody else, not, not a wife, not a father, not a mother not not a not a kid maybe will understand why we do those things yes yeah, sometimes you have to mute the world and put everything else on hold and just listen to that inner vision and guidance that tells you that you're going in the right directions and that you're you're making the right decision and it's important to know when it's speaking and if you are in tune with it and you trust it, then the trust is what gives you the strength to be able to shut everything on the outside off. You know, and I trust, I trust my inner voice because I've listened to it so many times and I've gone into situations and for even when it didn't look like it was going to work or even when everybody around me was telling me that it's not a good idea, but I've pushed through all of that resistance to follow what I felt deep inside me. And it's worked out nine times out of 10. Right. Right. You know, and, it, 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 you know this, this, this reminds me too, because, you know, I was just, like I said, I was just reading the new Testament and there's the scene where, uh, you know, Jesus goes into the temple and he kicks down all the tables of people, uh, you know, there, there's, there's like Pharisees and people in there selling things inside the holy temple. And he basically, kick, you know, he, he goes in there and he physically kicks down the tables and he throws them out. And I would, you know, thinking about that from the perspective of what we're just talking about of like, imagine if Jesus saw that, knew it was wrong, but was like, oh, people will like think I'm weird and like, want to like call the call the guards on me and stuff and like oh it's kind of you know i'm i'm, I'm kind of scared of doing that like that's you know that's that's he jesus was like obviously the model of like a man aligned with truth at all times and so just imagine if like he didn't imagine if he didn't do that would that story feel very heroic would that story feel very uh would that would that story bring a good lesson no not at all not at all no, all all of our all of our heroes did this, right? They did what he called advance on chaos in the dark, right? They they went into chaos and put things in order, and they went into the dark and shun shun their light on it. You know, they pushed through all of the internal resistance and the external resistance to pursue what they believed in what that or what they believed was right you know so yeah i understand completely now we move on a bit past this sort of um talk about kind of the conspiracy of society and he talks about one of the one of the one of the weapons that they um 
they, they use this for is, is virtues, right? Virtues are in the popular estimate, rather the exception than the rule. And he goes on to say, you know, men do what is called a good action as some piece of courage or charity, much as they would pay a fine in expiation of daily non-appearance on parade. Their works are done as an apology or an extenuation of their living in the world, as invalids and the insane pay a high board. Their virtues are penances. I do not wish to expiate, but to live. This is... I mean, th th this this took me a bit to get initially because I, I always associate virtue with with good, but I guess I guess the point of it is like the intention behind the virtue, right? And doing it not for, not because you feel like you have to, unlike from societal standards, but because you you feel like you have to on an internal level. I feel like that's the point. Right. I think we'll hear what he's really talking about is virtue signaling. Mm -hmm. Is people that don't do a lot of good. So they have to put on a show as if they do, right? Like I've actually noticed like the people that I've met in my life that help people the most on like an everyday basis, like really help people are the least virtue signaling people that I know. Right. Like they don't need to go on Instagram and make a post for this new cause or whatever the new um, saying is that's trying to get people to unite and push for some certain cause. They don't do all that stuff because – they're actually helping people in real life, right? right? And they actually have their hands on the ground. It's like a um, hierarchically circle, which is like a small circle inside of a larger circle inside of a larger circle. And in the smallest level of the circle, you have yourself. After you have self, you have your family. After you have family, you have your friends. After you have your friends, you have your, your neighborhood or your village. After that, you have, have your city and your nation. After that, you have the planet. Right. So it's like what it's basically saying is first you focus on yourself and you get everything about you in order. Right. right. So you, you get disciplined, you get your start living the way that you're supposed to live in the way mm -hmm. living in a respectable, honorable way. And when you're taking care of you, the next thing you focus on is your family, making sure that your family is good, making sure you can help them get opportunities or take care of your parents when they're older. Right. And raise your kids in the right way. Then yeah. if that's all okay, then I can start helping my friends. Then I can, and if I get that, then I'll start working on my neighborhood or my county, you know, or my town. And then I'll worry about the problems of the world. So you got a lot of people who, most of these virtue signaling people, they haven't even taken control of themselves. Right. They well, skip to the outermost ring and yes. they're trying to solve the problems of the world while they're unhealthy, they're depressed, they're into hooked on drugs alcohol binging netflix um yeah they have a terrible relationship with their family they have shallow friends right they they don't have any sense of community they live in a you know they're just another unit in a city that doesn't really care about them or anything and then yeah just go from there they right. don't have a sense of their nation or anything so they're virtue signaling like they're doing the work because the work's not actually going on in, in their life for real. So it's like, I don't listen to any of these people that their lives are in chaos, but they're trying to put the world in order. Right. You have, to put, yourself, you have to put yourself in order first, you know? And I, he even uh, preferences this by saying that, um, expect me to show no cause why I seek or why I exclude company. Then again, do not tell me as a good man did today of my obligation to put all poor men in good situations. Are they my poor? I tell thee, thou foolish philanthropist, that I grudge the dollar, the dime, the cent I give to such men as do not belong to me and to whom I do not belong. There's a class of persons to whom by all spiritual affinity I am bought and sold for them. For them I will go to prison if need be. But your miscellaneous popular charities, the education at College of Fools, the building of, <laughs> meeting, uh, the building of meeting houses to the vain end to which many now stand, alms to sots, which is basically, which means drunkards, and the thousandfold relief societies. Though I confess with shame, I sometimes succumb and give the dollar. It is a wicked dollar by which by and by I shall have the manhood to withhold. Well, so this is what it, yeah, this is, it's, it, it's funny too what he said. I, I got a quick point with this. It's funny too what he says, and he might not have. I don't know in his career when he wrote this specifically. I think this was earlier when he wrote Self Reliance, but um, 
you know, like, as we know now, a lot of these charities, such as, like, the Clinton Foundation and, like, these big charities that billionaires love to give their wealth to, it literally just, like, they, they only use a very small percentage of that to actually help people. And then when they help people, it's, like, not very good quality themselves. They just have, it's, like, basically just a huge marketing and PR funnel for billionaires to launder their wealth through. It all just ends up coming back to them anyway. Yeah, a hundred percent. Most of them, most of them are scams in that way, right? But it's like this is exactly he's talking about hierarchical circle here, right? He says, "Are they my poor?" He says, "I grudge a dollar and dime I give to them." He said, "But there is a class of persons to who I can be bought and sold for, and who I'll go to prison for." So he's talking about he he doesn't care about the people outside of the circle that you can't convince him. To, that he can save all these people and that's his responsibility to save them when he has people close to him that are truly his responsibility to save and to focus on and i'm going to take care of them for it first see that's that's the thing people will if you're not one of these virtue signaling people they'll conflate it and say that you don't care about the world or you don't care about anyone right it's like no i'm just not pretending to care about people that i don't know i'm going to focus i can't send energy and try to put the world in order when there's people in chaos around me that I actually care about and have a connection with. For them, I'll risk anything. It's not a matter of not wanting to give, it's about giving to the right people. For the people closest to me, they can have as much as I can give. Like, right? Or like, yeah, like, or like, you know, if I'm on the street, you know, and there's a dude there in my community, I, I'm, I, I'd give him a dollar, right? If he's just like homeless sitting there, but I'm not going to get psyoped to give money to a, a charity with a with a very dubious cause in Southeast Asia, you know, funded by this really rich dude, just because it's societally trendy right now. You know, I've even changed a little bit towards homeless people. Where and he actually talks about this. He's like, where he talks about the dollar he gives is a wicked dollar, and by and by he'll sh he shall have the manhood to withhold. What he's saying is that as time goes by, he gets stronger and stronger to the point where he's not giving anything because he doesn't mean anything with the dollar that he's giving. Like most of the time they give homeless people money, you're giving it to them to get them to leave you alone or so that you don't feel bad, right? But it's like, for me throughout life, I've, I've realized that like, say for instance, like um, we're not a third world country, like it's an advanced country. And like for you to end up homeless, in today's society, you basically almost have to screw over like everybody you've ever met, or you have to just really be like mentally deranged, which a lot of homeless people are. But it's like, so I've stopped feeling sympathy over the years, you know, like, just because like, I know that I can't really, really help these people. Like, I I used to give people bottles of water and things like that. But I can't really focus on anymore. Like, I got to only focus every little bit of energy that isn't going towards the people that I care about is wasted energy. Yeah, I I prefer to give tangible things because, you know, like, like you said, like a bottle of water, right? Like, that's just like, you know, th that there's only one purpose for that thing. Whereas maybe two if he's pissing in it, but, you know, like a buck, who knows what he's going to spend that at, right? And I'll like, like you to the intention too, like, what, wh why am I giving it? Do I actually, do I actually want to help this person out? Or do I feel like the, the sort of obligation, you know, these are right. all things that you can like, you know, it's not like go one way or another, like, you, oh, you have to just like start not giving money or you have to start giving all your money to home. Like, it's not about that. It's like, really like, ask yourself why you're doing this in the first place. Like ask, really, really get inside why, because there's probably other ways you can be helping people that are not just like these flippant, you know, very, you know, in the moment sort of things. You can probably do something. There's probably areas in your circle that you can actually nurture in the long run and deliver amazing growth and value and all that stuff. Yeah, I mean, I like what he said in like the next paragraph after this. He says, what I must do is all that concerns me, not what people think. So this rule, equally arduous and actual and in, an, in an intellectual life may serve for the whole distinction between greatness and meanness. And when he's saying meanness there, he's basically saying average, right? Mm -hmm. So he's saying doing what concerns you and ignoring what people think is the difference between being great and being average. That's very true. It is easy in the world to live after the world's opinion. 
It is easy in solitude to live after our own. But the great man is he who in the midst of the crowd keeps with perfect sweetness the independence of solitude. And this oh. is actually something that I've had to think about, right? Because I have all these compound plans and moving away from society, right? It's easy to live in solitude on your own. It's easy in the world to conform. But the great man is the one that can do both, that can go into the crowd and still be himself. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Like, I can't just retreat. Like, it's like, oh, get out, start a homestead. Like, you can't, that's great, right? And I think we need as many people as possible doing that, taking their um, their power, their food, their water into their own hands. Right, but it shouldn't but be done out of fear and lack and like this like closing up. Right, and at the same time, I'm not going to abandon society completely. Like I still like have an obligation to try to influence people and re- lead people and help people. Mm-hmm. right it'd be easy it's easy just to disappear very right very. but to consciously see to or to visibly see that there's a battle going on and to completely ignore it is not the way no no no, 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 no. the way is to put yourself in a position where you're not influenced by other people like be that the government be that uh all the people in the cities, right? But you should still be in the fight. Yeah, like the yeah. You know, if you can keep your first couple circles away, you know, you have your own homestead. You're you're self sustainable. Like all your basic needs are met. That actually makes you way more powerful to interact with the social sphere because right. you are not tied to it whatsoever, whatsoever. And your true friends and your true family, they're not going to give a damn what you say because what you say is the truth and you know you have to fulfill your highest vision and you know if you're taking care of everybody and you're nurturing right and you're 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 keeping your your lower circles in check right i mean like the it it is much easier to move through the world and to get what you want from the higher circles yeah 100 percent agreed he says that you know that gives you freedom yeah that's what we're all after that freedom and it, that, then that's true freedom too. It's not just following the passions. It's a it's a deliberate ordering of things close to you, so they're very predictable and they're very stable. So then you have like a you have like a stable you have a stable structure to go and do whatever you want in. Basically, it's not just immediately starting to do whatever you want. You have to kind of build to it. And you know he says that. It's easy to live in a world to live out of the world's opinion, right? And he goes into what that, what does that mean, right? He says, if you maintain a dead church, contribute to a dead Bible society, vote with a great party, either for the government or against it, spread your table like base housekeepers. Under all these screens, I have difficulty to detect the precise man you are. And of course, so much force is withdrawn from your proper life. But do your work and I shall know you. Now that right there, you know, that's powerful because think of, and, and I think a perfect model for this is modern politics, right? There is no distinction between, you know, MAGA supporter 848 and, you know, Biden shill 926, right? Yes. They all, it's, it's the same opinions. It's top down given. There's no introspection. It's, it's crowd-based behavior. And there has been no, you know, Maybe there's some like minor life things that brought you to that to that path, but but the opinions themselves, right, were just all top down given. And I, I genuinely, you can't discern what each person is because they're all the same when they align to a big sort of, you know, over, over commanding uh, social power. Right, and that's why that's why he says, if I know your sect, I anticipate your argument. Mm. I, you can't a lot of people they get these new beliefs and these ideologies and they become their personality right, right? I'm, a, I'm an end cap i'm a bitcoin maximalist it's like great i know everything about what you're gonna say this is boring right exactly you know it's like they take they take their beliefs and it becomes their whole identity it's like no my identity is just truth mm-hmm. and truth exposes me to certain beliefs right but it my identity is truth. It's not the belief. It's not the ideology. Right. Right. And um, 
he has a great great uh section here where he continues on this where he's like um this conformity makes them not false in a few particulars authors of a few lies but false in all particulars their every truth is not quite true their two is not the real two their four not the real four so that every word they say chagrins us and we know not where to begin to set them right and this is like what you experience like basically when you talk to an npc <laughs> it doesn't their two isn't the real two their four isn't the real four literally everything they say is just backwards and wrong and you don't even know where to start to correct them like right. it's almost impossible because they've been so brainwashed it's like there's no you don't even know where to start every little thing they say is so wrong it would take you 30 minutes just to unravel one statement each statement and you can't make i don't know if you ever talking to any of these people you can't make any progress because you basically have to deconstruct their entire view on every single subject in the world. It's very difficult. It's very difficult. And I actually, uh, I'm, I'm writing a piece on this um, as we speak, like how to actually help somebody. Because I think, you know, with the whole NPC phenomenon that, that, that's that been kind of like medically generated and, you know, made visible, you know, it is really hard. I mean, for example, like, set, like saturated fat, right? When you're talking about diets and stuff like that, like, Heart, like eggs cause heart disease right that's that, that 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 statement that very like compartmentalized statement that just ignores hundreds of thousands of years of like ancestral dieting and all this stuff just because some modern scientists said so like it's very difficult without any sort of training or like frank prior framework to try to break that and try to like get them on the path of truth yeah, these people have placed their beliefs and faith and beliefs in the institutions mm -hmm. and in, in the power structure. And the power structure now, it's not even necessarily just the government. It's not really just that anymore because it's it's more the useful idiots. It's the celebrities, the athletes, the Fortune 500 companies. That's that they believe that's the power structure that they believe in now. And all those people disseminate the same ideas out. You know, the movie star is saying the same thing as the basketball player, which is saying the same thing as Walmart and Target. And people are blinded by that. That's what they believe in. You know, those that's where they trust. Those are the sources they trust the most. And it's just another way of. Um, oh, wow. You have the exact same opinion as the World Economic Forum, the U.N., every major government. Wow. You must be a real independent thinker that got to those conclusions through nuanced research. Right. And it's just like it's it's actually so funny because in the beginning, he's talking about guys like us only listening to what Plato says or what Evola says or uh, even what Emerson says or what Nietzsche says, right? Like, and not listening to our own inner voice. These other people are doing the same exact thing, except just with this power structure of useful idiots. Right. So it's funny right. because you see the same trait on each end, just like the um, blue haired, they, them, vegan Black Lives Matter activists is the same as MAGA rally 45 45 it's the yeah. same behavior it's really interesting yeah and, and what you're saying right there too like when i'm reading emerson or when i'm reading something right i've what what i used to do when i was you know because i'm only i'm only 22 right like i'm very my brain was still like very porous you know especially when i first started reading this type of stuff so when i would read something for the first time that would break my worldview or like cause a shift i would immediately take it as gospel and like hardline defend it and hardline, you know, because it changed my worldview. So it'd be like, oh, this is the truth now. And so now what I really try to do is whenever I'm reading these, these like really dense topics written by extremely intelligent genius tier authors, I really try to like, with every line, really try to think, do I like, does this resonate with me? Why not? And I try to like, I try to really explore. I'm not trying to just, oh, this is what he said. This is truth. This is everything, right? It's like you have, it's like with the Bible too and stuff. Like when you're reading these, these dense texts, you need to be having a constant dialogue because if you're just, you know, especially with this book, like if you just take this as gospel without thinking, then you're doing exactly what he doesn't want you to be doing, you know?
Right. I say it like this. I hear everyone, but I listen to myself. Oh, yeah. There we go. You know, so, so like I'm, I'm paying attention, but I'm also not. And I've told people this before because people ask me like where I get my mindset from. And I've said, if you want to be like me, then be yourself. I yeah. listen to everything, but I decide I'm the person that influences me. I'm not influenced by anything outside of myself. Right. You know, and it's actually good to not be that way. Because he says, for nonconformity, the world whips you with its displeasure. And therefore, a man must know how to estimate a sour face. But the sour face of the multitude, like their sweet faces, have no deep cause, but are put on and off as the wind blows and the newspaper directs. And this is actually what I'm talking about, How why I have such a confidence in following what I believe and what I think is because the sour and the sweet faces have no meaning to them. Hmm. They have no depth. They, they, they change as the wind blows, right? Or as the newspaper or Instagram or Twitter algorithm right. directs right. them. So right. what they feel about me doesn't matter at all. No, it's not. Because, it's, it's a, yeah, like you said, it's a, it is, it is most literally a face. There's nothing right. else in there. It's a mask that they'll just swap out depending on what somebody else says. That's exactly what it is, you know? So. And to be honest, thinking about it now, you know, you should, you, we should be less scared of what these people think and more, more pity than anything. Like it's really sad that you don't think, and you're just having these opinions about me that you, you're just regurgitating. Like I, I actually feel for you, bro. Like that sucks. Sorry. Hope you can get through it. Right. Not, Oh God, his, his all almighty opinion, <laughs> the random guy I just met at the grocery store. Oh no, my entire world views collapsed. I'm like, nah, I don't know. He's, yeah. He's like, I, don't, I don't care what these people think. Most people can't even walk or breathe correctly. The things they do, the most, <laughs> they have no, they have no control over. They have no conscious awareness of. So it's like, they don't feel or think anything really. They're oh, just, yeah. Oh, these damn Woda mouth breathers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they're they're reactors, not creators. That's you know, good. They're, yep. they're, they're consumers, not producers. Yep. So I don't care what they feel about me because they don't feel anything strongly. Hmm. They don't have a real feeling or gut. They don't feel that real pull on their gut and that intuition that drives them towards things. So. Right everything that they say is it's titular and ephemeral you know it fades comes and goes right and i mean what they're all what they're all struggling with is is this very is this next paragraph they, he says the other terror that scares us from self-trust is our consistency a reverence for our past act or word because the eyes of others have no other data for computing our orbit than our past acts and we are loath to disappoint them right especially with social media these days Everything we want, like, especially if you're somebody who posts frequently, everything we do is online. Everything we do is online and people are terrified. You know, I mean, you know, the witch hunts, right? Where people go back in 2009 and find the one tweet where they like made a joke about women or something or made a joke about Jews or whatever. And then that whole dude's life is just destroyed. He has to make an apology, all this stuff, right? That terror, you know. The terror comes a from people not knowing how to deal with that, and not and, and not just like learning to own things. But b it's like it's like the, the terror of, of consistency, right? We have this, you know, if if you are a if your social brain, let's put it that way, rather than rather than solitude and inner circle brain, as we kind of been using that model, right? Then your consistency is like like we we're talking about in the early tribes. Your consistency with what you do and say is your your goal like you can't change your opinions with new information well yes and no so this next part is actually like one of the ones that confused me and that i had to really think about a lot because he talks about consistency right and he says a foolish consistency is the hobgoblin of little minds exactly. adored, adored by little statesmen and philosophers and divines with consistency a great soul has simply nothing to do he may as well concern himself with a shadow on the wall Speak what you think now in hard words, and tomorrow speak what tomorrow thinks in hard words, though it contradict everything you said today. Ah, shall you, so you shall be sure to be misunderstood. Was well, that so bad then to be misunderstood? Pythagoras was misunderstood. Socrates, Jesus, Luther, Copernicus, 
Galileo, Neat, Newton, and every pure and wise spirit that ever t- took flesh to be great is great. misunderstood. Yeah. You know, so it's like that one was hard for me because it's like, okay, we're deciding the values that we want to live by, right? And we're mm-hmm. making these flash opinions like nonchalant boys on things and taking stances. And it's like you can actually contradict yourself as well. Mm. You know, and it's not the end of the world. Like you should only now if you're in line, what I've noticed is if you're in line uh, aligned, you're not gonna be off a lot. But sometimes you will be, but that's fine, right? You don't have to be beholden to what you thought a year ago, or what you believed five years ago, or what you believed ten years ago. There's always a new level to hit. Basically. Yeah, you're, you should always be constantly evolving and growing, and you shouldn't use a stance you took two years ago as the reason why you can't see things in a different way today. Mm-hmm. Right. So it's like, um, it's like the old tweets thing, right? If somebody digs up a tweet from 2009 on you, it's like, okay, I don't even hold that opinion anymore. So why are you, why, like, I'm not going to, like, what, what, a, what a great man would do is just not apologize. Just, you know, right. And there's a, point out the reality that everyone who's doing that is insane and looking just for, for a fight to start and I don't even hold that opinion anymore. So whatever. Yeah. And it. it's, it's a learning moment too. Yeah. Because it says, um, it seems to be a rule of wisdom, never to rely on your memory alone, which that's actually true. Never trust your memory. Always write things down. Oh like, yeah. Oh yeah. Never, never trust it. Right. But it says scarcely even in acts of pure memory. But to bring the past for judgment into the thousand eyed present and live ever in a new day. So, like, you should be bringing your past up for judgment to see if it's right or not, mm-hmm. to see if you're still on course. Mm-hmm. Very true. Right. So, like, it may have felt true in that moment. And you may have believed it based off the stimulus in your environment at that time, but bring it into the present and see if it still measures the same. Right. You know, maybe, maybe it's wrong. Maybe it's right. Maybe you've advanced, maybe you've regressed, you know, um, let me see. Well, I mean, that, that sort of introspective nature, a lot of people just don't, don't, that doesn't even come to their mind to do is to like, Oh, may, like, let me, let me think about my past actions and see if there's something I can gain from that. Like most people don't even touch that. Yeah, and I'm going to jump ahead to this one quote that I saw, but I do want to yeah. go back, back to something previously. But he said, the voyage of the best ship is a zigzag line of 100 tacks. Uh, yes, yes. See the, see the line from a sufficient distance, and it straightens itself to the average tendency. Yes. Your genuine action will explain itself. It will explain, explain other genuine actions. actions. Your conformity explains nothing. So what he's saying is like, all right, if a, if a ship is sailing from – England to America, it doesn't just move in a straight line, right? It's going, it, it zigzags, like mm-hmm. it's going left and right, at, but the whole time it's going forward. And when you look at it from afar, when the journey is complete, it seems like one straight line, right? Right, And that's what life is as well. It's like when you're going for something in your life, you're, it's never going to be a direct path. You're yes. going to have to step over to the left over here. You're going to have to climb over this obstacle here you're going to have to move back to the right maybe you have to move a little further right but as long as you keep going forward at the end of the day it seems like you took a straight path there and that's the same way it goes with your beliefs and your values like Mm -hmm. it all uh it all can it each contributes to the next step that you're going to take like when you know like when when somebody's uh you know, when somebody's like reading a book or writing a book, right? Most uh, everyone else just sees I'm writing a book and then the book comes out and it's published and cool. Nobody sees the, the, the thousands of drafts, the, the deleted pages, the, the pacing around the room, none of that. But the fact that the guy every single day got on his computer or got on, pulled out his pen and paper and just decided to write means that eventually the book was done. And on a, like you said, zoom out on a long enough time, time scale and like every single one of those failed drafts contributed forward right and he says let me record day by day my honest thought without prospect or retrospect and i cannot doubt it will be found symmetrical though i mean it not and see it not so 
at the end of the day, it's all going to line up, right? Even if you don't intend it to. Like, I've actually found this, like, I always say, like, if you want to get wherever you want in life, all you have to do is reverse engineer what you want, right? See what type of person you would have to be in, what type of daily actions you would have to take to achieve what you want. And as long as you keep moving in that direction on an everyday basis and stay alive, you're eventually going to get there. Very true. Right? And it's like, you'll be living in the truth even if you don't mean to, or even if you are confused in the moment, right? Like, as long as you're moving forward with certainty, you don't have to have certainty in every single moment. But when you look back at it, you'd be like, okay, that I did things the right way. I approached things the right way. He says, act singly, and what you have already done singly will justify you now. Greatness appeals to the future, right? That, it's that future-oriented mindset, right? Starting from where you want to be and working backwards. Right. Greatness appeals to the future, not the present or the past. Like, Alexander the Great didn't go like, okay, so we're going to go over here and see if we can take this place, and oh, shit, like we have this other place. No, he was like, okay. So in five years, I own all of the Middle East right here, and we're stru- we're touching into Asia and India and all this stuff. Like, this is already owned. So how do we get there? Okay, we got to we here's the path. Here's the path. We cut the knot. We do all this stuff, right? It's it, you know the, the the bigger the plan, the more you need to be able to see in the future and really really meditate on. It. And I mean, you've taught me this regarding visualization with those uh that that I, I for, forgot what forgot that book you gave me, but. It was uh, the, that, ma- the master key system. Master key system where it's just extremely deep visualization of, you know, exactly what you want out of life. Yeah. If, um, what's the saying? I don't, I don't remember the saying, but it's something about how if you don't set the ship in the right course, like any direct, any wind direction will do, right? So it's like you'll end up wherever if you don't right. have a direction. So, it's the same exact thing. Like you just have to get really clear on your direction, get really crystal clear on it, be able to visualize everything to the finest detail. Like I know what direction I want my bedroom and my living room facing it. I know what type of flooring I want. I know what type of produce I want to grow, what type of animals I want to have. I know what my friend's I want to know what I want my friends to be like. I know what kind of activities I want to do with them on a daily basis. I know what time I want to be waking up and what time I want to be going to sleep. I know what type of clothes I want to wear and what material they're made out of. All right. I know what activities I want my children to be involved in and at what age I'm going to let them switch to different activities of their choice. I have created the vision and now it's just all about moving in that direction. But you need to get really crystal crystal clear on what it is that you want. And it needs to be something powerful and something that that sets you on fire inside so that you have the drive to go for it every single day. Amen. Amen. Right there. Right there. And then, you know, when you when you align for that and when it's so when your intentions are so pure, right, in a sense, because greatness can be so greatness is pure. Right. Striving for good greatness is so pure in that you're doing it because you need to. That's it. You're not doing it to to convince everybody or to, you know, you know, oh, I got to I got to get I got to get this one girl. And that's why I'm going to do all this. No, you do it from the inside. Right. And that's why he says down at the end of the paragraph, right. Honor is venerable to us because it is no ephemera. It is always ancient virtue. We worship it day to day because it is not of today. We love it and pay homage because it is not a trap for our love and homage, but it is self-dependent, self-derived, and therefore an old immaculate pedigree, even if shown in a young person. Yes. It's that honor, universal cord. Yes, it, that's what it is. Like honor is timeless. It's it's like this is one of those things that's just real. Like you know it when you see it. Right? And that's why we have such a high respect for it and why it's something that we aim to be or why we're so impressed when we see it because it's it's beyond just space and time and that's what we should be seeking for is to live in an honorable way and we don't see it a lot today as well which is why it's such a big deal when you do see someone that is willing to die behind the things that they believe in and stand behind them no matter what the consequences are 
Mm -hmm. Definitely. Let's see. Where should we? Where should we head to? You know, we can actually build off this right here. We're, we, um, he's talking about how, you know, whatever, you know, a, a man Caesar is born and for ages we have a Roman Empire. Christ is born and millions of minds so grow and cleave to his genius that is confounded with virtue and the possible of man. Institution is the lengthened shadow of one man. As monarchism of the Hermit Antony, as the Reformation of Luther, Quakerism of Fox, Methodism of Wesley, abolition of Clarkson, Scipio, Milton called the height of Rome, and all history resolves itself very easily into the biography of a few stout and earnest persons. Yeah, so that kind of aligns with what Thoreau said, where like the mass of men lead lives of quiet desperation, mm -hmm. where it's like, civilization and society is the result of a few great men pulling everybody else up at one time. Mm -hmm. That's how it usually works. Like it's not that most people are living a quiet life of conformity. Right. And it's the people that blaze the trail that lifts civilization up. One man impacts a billion people say like Steve jobs, one man elevated all of society technologically. Right. Right. But, and so like, like that's you, for example, right? You don't like you're one dude and you have how many followers? How many people like deeply trust your word? Yeah, I don't know. Thousands, tens of thousands. So right. it's like that's and that's what a lot of um a lot of it's like a movie. There's only like five main characters in the movie, right? But life is like that. Hmm. There's main characters and then just a bunch of extras. <laughs> And the, the characters are the ones that impact the story. Right. And, you know, when, when you see these stories, right, when you think of Martin Luther, when you think of Jesus Christ, when you think of Caesar, when you think of, you know, any George Washington, right? You shouldn't think of, gosh, what a great man. Like, hope we have one of those guys in our age. No, you should think of, I have that same spark inside of me. How can I find that and, and let it out? Right. Yes. All of it. You you have your own Martin Luther in you or your own Shakespeare or your own Caesar. And it's not so much ab about just letting those guys be the guys, but it's like finding it in yourself and bring it out into the world. Right. Align with what you, you know, what you're drawn to and what you're good at versus, you know, that's, and that's the other thing, too, is with these sorts of things, you don't want to just, oh, you know, like Martin Luther, you know, did, you know, he, he, he was, he started Protestantism, right? So I got to go like reform Christianity or something like that. Or like Shakespeare wrote plays, I have to be a player. Right? No, 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 no. That's, you're, you're just going to get screwed up there. It has to be totally aligned with your, with the truth that you can follow, basically. Yeah. And he talks about a, a fable where he says, the fable of the sot, which is like a drunk, yeah. who was who was picked up dead drunk in the street, carried to the duke's house, washed and dressed and laid in the duke's bed, and on his waking treated with all, all the obsequious ceremony like the duke, and assured that he had been insane, owes its popularity to the fact that it symbolizes so well the state of man, who was in the world a sort of sot, but now and then wakes up exercises his reason and finds himself a true prince so mm -hmm. that story is about basically a drunk guy ends up in the duke's bed and he wakes up in the morning and they treat him like royalty right and it's like everybody has that and there's no difference just because just because he's put himself in the position of royalty right right so it's like everybody has that nobody side to them and then they have the great man hero side of them right. and it's in you you just have to believe that's in you and if you put yourself in that position and live that way the world will see you as such right exactly and you know i mean he, he continues that on the bottom right he says our reading is mendicant and uh, sycophantic in history our imagination plays as false kingdom and lordship power and estate are gaudier vocabulary than private john and edward in a small house and common day's work but the things of life are the same to both the sum total of both is the same so that's the thing like you don't need 
there's there's a level of greatness that you can get to and there's like there's like a a, a truth and a in a um d divine way to live your life that doesn't require like like you can there, there's a there's a way to be great without being the massive materialist king and and i think there's a you know we're, we get a lot of that today with like the lamb the lambo you know culture the miami culture right like you don't have to do that to be a successful business guy or whatever right yeah no that's not necessarily what it's about you know that's just one part of the game is resource is acquiring resources and money and the ability to take care of yourself and facilitate experience throughout your life and take care of people around you and give people opportunities right but that's just one part of it well i mean in, in your in your circumstance too i mean uh, how many people have you met where they've been in a high quote unquote social status, but you, you, you would have absolutely no desire to live their life or be in their social circle or anything like that. I've met a lot of people like that. And I've met a lot of people that have obtained material riches, but they're spiritually and mentally and emotionally poor. Right. You know, like if I talk to them, they don't have a lot to offer. Like, unless I was asking them how they built their business. Yeah. Oh, oh, that's the one thing I can talk about, right? They are, that's all they really got. There's nothing else really to them. So you can see that if you just max in that one direction, that's not going to give you everything. And that's why I'm in the train everything mindset. Mm -hmm. It's because right. I don't just want to be, it's no different from being uh, just a mid-level employee. Right. They still consumed and every still have their every waking moment consumed by just this path of acquiring currency right and right. it's like they're not filling themselves up in any other way just like the guy that's rushing out the door to get to starbucks and get to work every morning <laughs> they're, they're both as empty-minded right right you just put you put yourself in a, in a, in a self-created rat race in a sense right you know now she goes on right he says, and this is one of my, this is this is this kind of swings back to what we were talking about initially with with intuition. The magnetism which all original action exerts is explained when we inquire the reason of self trust. Who is the trustee? What is the aboriginal self on which a universal reliance may be grounded? Right, because trust implies two parties. Right. So, what is the nature and power of that science baffling star without parallax, without calculable elements, which shoots a ray of beauty even into trivial and impure actions, and the least mark of independence appear? The inquiry leads us to that source, at once the essence of genius, of virtue, and of life, which we call spontaneity or instinct. We donate this primary wisdom as intuition, whilst all later teachings are tuitions. In that deep force, the last fact behind which analysis cannot go, all things find their common origin. Yeah, that's where he's talking about how we lie in the lap of immense intelligence, which makes us receivers of truth and organs of its activity. When we discern justice, when we discern truth, we do nothing of ourselves but allow a passage to its beams. Right? So like every, all the knowledge and information that we've collected it's just like the truth in the universe speaking through us and we have access to it at all times we're the organs of its activity it doesn't exist or flow through except through us and and that 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 makes me come back to the ob subje objective world through subjective views because when you get to these um when you get to these levels of truth that it you know it, it, it it's not like it's not like you made that up at all it's like, you know, it's like it just came from inside you. Like it said, it was beamed down from you from the stars that, oh, this is this is what I need to say right now. You didn't just like craft it up over years of thinking and toiling and all these experiments and stuff. No, it just came to you. Yeah, and that, that's what he talks about even later. He's like, um, this voice, basically, its presence or its absence is all we can affirm. Every man discriminates between the voluntary act of his mind and the involuntary perceptions and knows that to his involuntary perceptions a perfect faith is due so he may set error in the expression of them but he knows that these things are so like day and night not to be disputed so basically what's going on is you have two voices inside you the one of where you're telling yourself what to do and the one where god is telling you what to do right, right? and what you need to know 
is how to listen to that involuntary perception and then have perfect faith in it. Right. Well, yeah. and, uh, and you no, may, and he says yeah. you may err in the expression of it. Yes. Yes. That's, that's so crucial. But to know yeah. that it's true, like I may not be able to explain something perfectly, but if I can, if I feel it and know it inside, that's all that matters. And right. I still need to express it and act on it. And over time, it'll be, I'll have more knowledge of it and I'll understand it better. Yes, but or in the expression of them, right? He, 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 put, he, I'm glad he put that line there because, you know, just because truth is such a powerful weapon and just because we get the truth doesn't mean we know how to wield it right off the bat. Like we need practice in wielding it. And so even if you know you're right, maybe the channels in which you're delivering it to the world need, uh, need refinement, right? Like maybe you know something, but your speaking ability is not up to the part yet, or your, 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 your debate or your, your use of Aristotelian logic is not up to the par yet. Right. Like there's some, there's, there's ways that you can work it out, but it doesn't mean that what you have is false. Right. And, and I think and also that this is came to me, right. That isn't that why, doesn't that sound like a lot of like what adults would like stamp on a kid for, like if a kid is like, I don't really like the Iraq war and the adults are like, Oh, you just don't understand. They have weapons of mass destruction. Right. It's like that kid could tell internally something was wrong, but the adult himself was so programmed that he couldn't, you know, he couldn't just let that let, let he can, he can see the, uh, the truth in the, in the innocence in a sense. Yeah. Children usually have accurate perceptions of things because they're like left brained right where they see the interconnectivity mm -hmm. connectedness of all things but they're also trying to use their right brain to make logic and sense of everything mm -hmm. so they're balancing everything out at the same time and because of that they have a great and accurate sense and perception of what's really going on and what's good or bad and we are very right brained as adults especially in today's world because today's world ex selects for it and pushes you in that direction mm -hmm. that we've lost contemplation of the whole and like we worship the little parts right oh yeah big time right there. that's a good one that's a good one right there right you 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 post that one up on uh on the wall somewhere yeah i put that one out before <laughs> <laughs> and then you know, you know, and it says uh thoughtless people contradict as readily the statement of perceptions as of opinions or rather much more readily for they do not distinguish between perception and notion. They fancy that I choose to see this or that thing, but perception is not whimsical, but fatal. If I see a trait, my children will see it after me. And in, in course of time, all mankind, although it may chance that no one has seen it before me, for my perception of it is as much fact as the sun. So he's talking about, this one was kind of hard for me to understand, but. This was, yeah, this is, this is a bit confusing. Right. But what I really see is that like, he's talking about, I, I, I read it because he's talking about how his children will see it after him. Mm -hmm. So the actually kids are a good confirmation for things. Like if you see it as true and a child sees it as true at the same time, it probably makes a lot of sense. And it's probably really aligned with what is actually going on because you're using um, your judgment from a place of skepticism and the child is seeing things from a place of trust and when a skeptic and a trusting person have the same opinion on something it's usually pretty accurate yeah that's a that's a very good sign and that's also a good yeah it's 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 a good reason why you know that whole you know it's it's, it's hammer now but diversity of thought is very important in that when values are aligned right when the values are aligned but people have different you know, ways of reaching those in a sense, then that's where you can get that like beautiful creative mix and really like really get to know problems and figure out solutions at like a lightning quick speed. This next paragraph is, I told myself to read it, but I think it just sounds really cool. Oh, let's <laughs> do it. I underline it. it. Take the stage, take the stage. Okay, all right. The relations of the soul to the divine spirit are so pure that it is profane to seek to interpose helps. It must be that when God speaketh, he should communicate not one thing, but all things. 
should fill the world with his voice, should scatter forth light, nature, time, souls from the center of the present thought and new date and new create the whole. Whenever a mind is simple and receives a divine wisdom, old things pass away. Means, teachers, texts, temples fall. It lives now and absorbs past and future into the present hour. All things are made sacred by relation to it, one as much as another. All things are dissolved, dissolved to their center by their cause. And in the universal miracle, petty and particular miracles disappear. If therefore a man claims to know and speak of God and carries you backward to the phraseology of some old moldered nation in another country, in another world, believe him not. Is the acorn better than the oak, which its fullness and completion? Is the parent better than the child and to whom he has cast his ripened being? Whence then this worship of the past? The centuries are conspirators against the sanity and authority of the soul. Time and space are but physiological colors which the eye makes, but the soul is light. Where it is, is day. Where it was, is night. And history is an impertinence and an injury, if it be anything more than a cheerful apologue or parable of my being and becoming. Yeah, he was he was spitting bars there. What I really liked is when he was talking about is the acorn better than the oak? Is the parent better than the child? Right? They're all the same thing. There's no more greatness in the seed than there is in the full grown plant, in the full grown tree. They were both great in what they are. They were both perfect for what they needed to be. Right, and that's and that's whatever you know. When Christ said that those who uh, you know those who harm the little ones will get cast, a, will get a stone wrapped around their neck and thrown in the ocean. Right, you know he was talking about how like pe- like the the child and the, the child and the and the adult are on the same level value wise, but the the child has that innocence to him. So if you corrupt the innocence, right? If you if you are if you're intentionally corrupting the innocence. You are you are committing a major major sin right there major sin. Whenever a mind is simple and receives a divine wisdom, old things pass away. Means teachers, texts, temples fall. It lives now and absorbs past and future into the present hour. I love that. Like when your mind is open, and that knowledge and that wisdom speaks into you, it like it's like a. It's like a virus that just mm. overwrites all the old coding. It's cutting and programming, you, you know, and it just like reshapes you immediately and reshapes your entire experience and view of the world. Yeah, it's puts uh, a new meaning to everything. Revelation is trans trans transmorphatory. It's it's unbelievable what you know. It could be a simple sentence, and I can like completely alter the trajectory of your worldview for the next you know fifty years and then we have you know i mean that 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 that, i think that's one of my favorite paragraphs of this whole work personally and he says oh i like this he says um he's talking about man man postpones or remembers he does not live in the present but with reverted eye laments the past or heedless of the riches that surround him stands on tiptoe to foresee the future he cannot mm. be happy and strong until he too lives with nature in the present above time. So mm. that's like all this talk about, oh, return, right? Like everybody's always like, there's, there's like two types of people. And I found like our people, like on our side are more like concerned with the past and trying to recreate the past. And all the people on the other side are obsessed with creating this future. Yeah. Right? In this new world where things are different. And uh, we all act and behave a certain way. And there's all this inclusion and equity and equality and all these things, right? They're like on the opposite side. And we're all talking about return to tradition, right? But the perfect man, the man who's alive with nature lives in the present. 100%. You know, because like, like you said, like the other side is so focused on building out a future. Like they're so future minded, but they are, it's, it's a totally pathological future. Meanwhile, you know, quote unquote, this side is more looking to the past, but what, what staring into the past does, it's like staring into Medusa, it turns you into stone, 
and you don't want to act or you want, or you, or you lament about how, how better it was back then and how it, it can't be better today, which is just totally false. Right. It is like, and actually the perfect blend is to be able to do both. Mm -hmm. Like, okay, build a homestead, but with modern construction means. Yep. Right. Like instead of having to do everything by shovel and by a horse and buggy, right. It's the, it's the blend of the two. Like, oh, return? Like, no, actually, I don't need to return. I'm going to live a better life than those people live because I they were doing everything because they had no choice. And that's mm -hmm. just the way things were. I can consciously make things the way I want them to be. I can search for more good things than they could could have, and I can have access to it. Like, I, if I decide to, something as simple as deciding to make all my cookware either glass or um cast iron like nobody could have decided that before no, no right? they might have had it but it wasn't by some choice i can make i can decide which type of fabrics i'm going to put my children in or i'm going to wear that are healthier and not um not filled plastic. with plastic not plastic <laughs> right like that's a good thing like people in the past like we can actually do it better because there's so many different things that they didn't know about that we have access to the information to and it's like we can implement things that they could have never dreamed of implementing and part of that is because we live in the modern world right. beautifully said beautifully said you know em emerson had to build probably with you know pine trees and fur and all that type of stuff whereas we can import you know bamboo and all these things that you know wouldn't even be conceivable at that time you know we can we can make whatever we want and also to the collaboration factor it's way easier you know, in these days to collaborate with people all across the country and to like centralize in one place and build something truly magnificent than it was, you know, in his time where you had to do letters and meet up and then, you know, the country wasn't as big and, you know, it was, it was the infrastructure was less there. So it would take, take, you know, weeks to, to meet up and, you know, you can't just make internet money and just get, you know, magic numbers inserted into your account to go buy whatever you need. Right. Yeah. So it's like, we actually are in the best time that we could live so far because we have more options and more opportunity. So it's like, instead of just having this reverence for the past or instead of these people that are in this pathological future, like it's about taking the good of this world and combining it with the good of the old world mm -hmm. and actually being able to have the ability to cut away the bad and, and to hone in on these few good things, we're living in a great time in history. If you look, when you look at it that way, oh, amazing! Yeah, and I mean, like Owen Benjamin said it perfectly. He said like it's like it is going to continue to get worse, and it's also going to continue to become better. It just depends on where you are and like what you're what you're doing. If you're self directed, this is going to be the greatest time to live. If you're not, you're going to hell. Like you're going to hell. Yeah. <laughs> oh, here's a great quote. He says, and I'm going to paraphrasing some of these to make them make more sense because some of the way he writes, it's like if you don't have the rhythm down or you don't know some of the words or the context, it's hard to understand. It, but, it, it, you have it physically in front of you. Like, yeah. No. <laughs> right. Um, he says, the highest truth remains unsaid, probably cannot be said. For all that we say is the far off remembering of the intuition. Mm. So what he's saying there is like, I actually tweeted about this recently where I was talking about, I was reading about this monk that he started to understand so much and learn so much that he decided that speaking was a waste of time because he could never actually convey the truth. Wow. Right? And the highest truth will always remain unsaid and probably can't be said because it's just us trying to imitate what our intuition is telling us. Right. Trying to, ex in explaining, you already lose some of the meaning and some of the feeling. Right. You can never actually fully explain the deepest truths. And, and the people that are who we respect and look up to the most, like Emerson's and Thoreau's and all these other great authors and writers, it's because they were the ones who got closest to being able to speak the truth. Correct. And this yeah. is what he talked about in like the first couple of paragraphs.
is about how our own thoughts return to us in an alienated majesty when someone that's when someone is able to capture some of this truth and put it into words where we can recognize it and see it but mm. at the end of the day it's just a far off remembering of our intuition there it's we like go. we're trying to paint what we see in our mind's eye with words there we go there we go and that remind that, that reminds me of our uh, that conversation we had regarding business writing a few months ago how the, the, the you know like the we were we were both reading this book and we were both like wow he writes so much better than everybody today and, you know we're kind of just looking at down the years the quality of public writing has just completely tanked and there's this whole whole cope around like writing as simply as possible and if for efficiency and business writing and whatnot. And what that does is it just, it, it makes, it makes it very clear for like very worldly surface level things, but you end up sounding exactly the same as everybody else. And you're, there's no deeper exploration involved whatsoever. Yeah. And I think it's actually difficult to write and like, or to get this close to the truth or hone on it like they could back then because there's too much noise in today's world mm -hmm. right like this guy probably had hours a day of pure silence no phone nobody getting in time contact with him just in the world and in his own mind right? right we don't spend enough time alone in our mind to be able to remember the intuition like he's talking about no like we can't no, like not. We're, we're hearing too many voices. There's advertisements everywhere we go. We've got the cellular device attached to our hip. The world <laughs> is moving fast. We're driving from place to place. Like there's just so much going on. We're hardly ever alone now. Ralph Waldo right? Emerson did not have gas station TV. Right. Like, <laughs> that's, well, that's the thing, like, right? Like it used to be when you're alone, you were alone. But now with the internet and technology, we're at, you're never alone. The world is always with you. Yeah. That's a habit I'm trying to break too, is to not, to not need to grab my phone when I, when I, when I'm alone or I can just, I, to learn to just be one with my thoughts and to just relax into them. When I don't have my phone or I, I scale back my internet usage, my thoughts are all instantaneously deeper. Mm -hmm. Like just an hour without my phone, my thoughts evolve and change. Yeah. Because it's like, I think even when like, it's around you or near you, you have a conscious awareness of it. Right. But like removing it completely, all you're hearing is the voice in your head and, and the intuition, and you're hearing it more clearly than ever. It's making sense. And I think what actually happens too is when you spend a lot of time in solitude like this, your thoughts become incredibly deep and profound, and you get more of a desire to share them and put them out as well. So it's like, Doubly I, powerful. Because... I noticed, yeah, I, I noticed that too. When I was off Twitter for, you know, when I when I I take a week break, you know, here or there, and I noticed that my long form thinking comes back. Right, and it's like you have so much to say, and when you're not saying it, when it's finally time to talk, you're going to say the things that are most important that would have been on your mind the most. Right, right, as opposed to like where now we don't really. Uh, establish a hierarchy of our ideas or our thoughts or our feelings that we want to express to other people. We're just taking every random one that pops up because the communication is available to us. But when you take that communication away and you start to desire to be able to communicate, you're going to start to have an order and sequence in terms of importance of what you want to say. So you're going to, your thoughts are going to get deeper and more profound and you're going to know which ones are the important ones and need to get out and which ones don't. Very true. Very true. Yeah, yeah. You can, you'll have that, you know, when you're, yeah, you're in touch with your intuition, you'll have that, that internal ordering will come back. Yeah. Very powerful. Now, you know, the next page, or I guess, are, are you, are you looking at this digitally? Yep. Okay. So I guess in, for me, the next page, this this these these next two paragraphs were like starting with life only avails not the having lived and then this is the ultimate fact which is so cool. these were very uh difficult for me i had to do these a couple times um to get were there any lines that jumped out to you in this one 
Power ceases in the instant of repose. It resides in the moment of transition from past to a new state. And the shooting of the goal from the garden to an end. Interesting. So you think that, the, that to me that implies like power and motion are very linked. Power only exists in motion. Right. It doesn't exist when it's not acting upon anything. That's true. That's true. That's true. You know, like, I mean, you're not powerful unless you're taking the actions. Yeah. You can yeah. have all the right ideas that you want. It doesn't mean anything. That's not strength. That's not power. Power is putting them into play. Right. Yeah. Power. Yeah. Yeah. You, you're known as powerful for those for those moments in which you demonstrate the power, not right. because you have the things. Right. Like we don't. We don't like one. For example, like we don't call Mark Zuckerberg powerful, even though like he yes he has lots of things. Right. I'm talking about on a on a man man on man level. Right. Mm -hmm. We don't we don't consider him powerful. We consider somebody like. I don't, I don't know. We consider like a, a George Washington or a Alexander the Great or, you know, a, a great creative or a, you know, a, 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 a soldier, right? We, like power comes to mind for somebody like Jocko Willink much more than a Mark Zuckerberg. Right. I agree. And you know, he uh, said, I'm, I'm thinking about this as well. He's like, um, where is it? says this one fact the world hates that the soul becomes for that forever degrades the past turns all riches to poverty all reputation to a shame confounds the saint with the rogue shoves jesus and judas aside equally so basically like you know no matter what you believe or you push for it's kind of sick because in the end it's all going to be misconstrued anyways yeah right like all riches will become poverty at some point all reputations turn to shame i mean look at just like statues of people that people used to worship a hundred years ago being torn down all over the place right right time is going to change the perception of everything yes and it's going to take and, and nothing lasts forever it doesn't matter what it is whether it's a good image or a bad image it doesn't last forever yeah for the great cities of rome are now you know the great you know, all the sprawling things it's now just ruins you know for once once what was right this great city now is just instagram girls taking pictures walking around it <laughs> see it's just like i'm gonna conquer the whole world and you know a thousand years later it's just <laughs> girls taking pictures yeah like, you know so like that's something to really think about it's like um it can be nihilistic for some people because he's kind of saying like none of it matters mm -hmm. But that's it shouldn't make you feel nihilistic. It should just give you like more of a trigger happy feeling where it's like, man, I should just do whatever I want and live after my own accord because at the end of the day, it doesn't matter. You know, right. it's all it's all a cycle. Right. Yeah. Play play your part in the heart in the symphony of history. Right. Don't just, that's, don't just wait. That's that's all you can do, you know? And no matter what, if you're honorable in today's time, then another day you might not be. And if you're dishonorable in today's time, then another time you might not be, you know? So who knows? I like when he says, who has more obedience than I masters me, though he should not raise his finger. Around him I must revolve by the gravitation of spirits. We fancy it rhetoric when we speak of eminent virtue. virtue. We do not yet see that virtue is height. And that a man or a company of men, plastic and permeable to principles, by the law of nature must overpower and ride all cities, nations, kings, rich men, poets who are not. So this 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 was a a great little passage because he who has more obedience than I masters me. So that's great because like whoever has more self control. And more discipline masters me though right. he should not raise his finger he's he's bettering you just by the act of the way that he lives right and just by living a principled life you know he says we fancy we fancy at rhetoric when we speak of virtue what we do not see yet is that virtue is height 
So some, so what he's saying is virtue is height. Some men are taller than others. Like height is one of those measures that's permanent, right? Where it's like someone's either taller than you or they're not, or they're shorter than you, right? And he's like, it's the same thing with virtue. Virtue makes a man taller in a non-physical sense. Like we're just talking about his character, right? It makes him more of a man, right? And you can't ignore it. And that man or company of men, of tall men who are permeable, permeable or plastic to principles, which means principles are, they, they mold themselves through them, to them and the principles flow through them. By the law of nature, they must overpower cities, nations, kings, rich men, and poets who are not. So men of virtue must overpower men who are not of virtue. Yeah, it just happens. It's just what is. It's going to happen at some point, no matter what. Virtue yep. will rise. Yep. Yep, 100%. 100%. I mean, we are, uh, you know, the, the, I mean, as you know, in the, in the you know the jujitsu room and whatnot and the you know the on the mats right like the scariest dude is the black belt who goes super light with the uh you know the, the lighter belts and whatnot and knows that at any moment any moment he can just come down and like immediately break a limb without yes. any hesitation like a john danaher right like if he's if he's teaching a kid or whatever he's rolling with them you know he's he's obviously not going to go for full submissions one he's gonna he's gonna play with them and whatnot like alexander Corellin, right a lot of his training was just like playing right playing with kids but you know that if if he needed to in one second he could he, he could destroy anybody and it was just very controlled and that's that's the exact type of person that eventually just by the law like he said by the laws of nature just takes over everything yeah there's actually another well, hold on, let me find it real quick. Uh, this it's this reminds me what you said reminds me of where he says we pass for what we are. Men imagine that they communicate their virtue of vice only by overt actions. Do not see that virtue of vice emit a breath every moment. Which is actually crazy because yesterday I was in this lounge that I hang out with, and a group of guys walked in, and I could tell by their vibe, especially this one dude, I could tell that he was a fighter. Like, and he didn't have cauliflower ears or anything like that, but I could just tell, right? I just had a sense of it because what happens is we're communicating at all times, whether we know it or not. And come to find out this dude like grew up with Khabib and is like, oh, okay. know, has, has won the PFL and like everything. Like he's like got like a 27 and eight record or something like super Dagestani dude. It's actually funny. The manager his manager was with him, who is friends with Khabib, Zabi, all these other Dagestanis, a group of Dagestani guys. But I could just tell by looking at him that he was a fighter. And it's like that height or that virtue was kind of the same thing. It's like when you come in contact with it, you know it. Yeah, pro it probably the probably the chin strap beard helped out. Yeah, a bit. That, that, <laughs> that helped a little bit. They did all have the same facial hair. And I talked to them and asked them about that, but they didn't really say much about it. But I did talk yeah. to them for a few minutes. And they were cool guys, but I've actually noticed this a lot. You can tell who's dangerous or who by just how people carry themselves or who's confident or who's um the their own their own torch where like they don't need light from others, like they admit it themselves and they have their own frame and their own sphere, their own bubble. Like they people I can I kind of see it as like people like erect a bubble outside of them of like confidence. Yeah. And you can tell that they can't be penetrated by other people. Yeah, and yeah. that's what he's talking about. When he's like, virtue is speaking at all time. It's not just through your words. Like, there's other ways that you wear it that you're not aware of. Well, and to me, that's the big. That was the biggest difference with the whole Habib Connor situation, right? I mean, Connor still hasn't recovered from that, but Habib's Habib's obedience to like a higher sort of level of of, of values you know, kept him focused on that fight. And whereas McGregor was out doing, you know, coke and a bunch of shit and wasn't at prime form. And he came in the fight and other than the cheating, right, he got completely steamrolled for four rounds. And then, you know, with the whole thing with Poirier and whatnot, like there, there was a level he hit where 
he he lost that internal sense of virtue and that internal like self-ordering and it, it's just been a spiral and the reason it hasn't completely crashed and burned is because he still is so naturally charismatic and, and like talented on a physical level but it's just like you, you could just see the career path and that is night and day from yeah we're, we're always we're always communicating and which is funny because like people will look at something like the green lines the green lines are <laughs> our pictures and be like all oh, this is bullshit but it's actually very real yeah we're always is. sending signals about who we are and how we feel about things it's, and how we view the world and our positioning in it and our relation to others right right it's totally a, it's like it's totally a meme at like what he's doing with some of the photos right but like the the principle is there right like how you stand how you stand without any direction tells a lot about you right how, how are your feet pointed how do you keep your head? How do you hold your woman? Like all these different things show how you, t how you think about yourself. You know, there's also that one great picture of Michael Phelps when he like barely won. And there's a picture in the pool of the like FM running, running the um, swimming, the Olympic race. And next to him is the guy who came in second. And the guy who came in second is staring at him. And Phelps is just looking at the finish line. And it's like winners focus on winning. Yep. Losers focus on winners. That you know, you and know. You, could, you could tell the difference in the mentality right there because there's only 10 meters left in the pool. One guy's focused on winning. One guy's worried about where what the other guy's doing. And the right. guy who wasn't worried, who was only worried about finishing and winning, was the guy who won. That's very true. That's very true. Yeah. Where you orient your focus is so key. That's so key. All right, let's continue onward. Now, okay. I like, okay, so I, I wanna skip ahead a paragraph because this this was really, you know, th th this, was, this is another summation of what we've been talking about, right? You know. If we cannot at once rise to the sanctities of obedience and faith, let us at least resist our temptations. Let us enter into the state of war and wake Thor and Woden, courage and constancy on our Saxon breasts. This is to be done in our smooth times by speaking the truth. Check this lying hospitality and lying affection. Live no longer to the expectation of these deceived and deceiving people with whom we converse. Right? Speaking the truth is basically all we have. Like, you know, we, we can't just go like beat the crap out of people, right? Because then we'll just get arrested and thrown in jail, right? It, it's much more effective in these times to speak the truth as, you know, as clearly and precisely as possible, as Peterson likes to say. What I like about that passage is like the first part where he's like, if we can't rise to the sanctities of obedience and faith, at, let us at least resist our temptations. At the base level, if you can't do anything else, you need to have self-control. Yeah. Yeah. And he says, let us enter into the state of war, which means sometimes you have to go to war against yourself. Mm -hmm. Like that, if you're not going to do anything else, if you're not going to go against war to war against principalities, at least go to war with yourself and against what's pulling you down. Yeah. Like that's, that's the least you can do. Right. And then, and it's again, it's like hierarchically circle. It's like returning to that base circle. And it's funny because, like, uh, he says, you, and then he's talking about if you're going to do more than that, he's like, this should be done in our smooth times. They're basically saying it's easy now. Yeah. It's not even difficult. It's not, you don't actually have to go to a physical war or risk any sort of physical harm these days, right? To be able to stand strong behind something and to have principles. Like, it's not going to cost you your life. No, no. It's way easier, way freaking easier. And people are still scared, which is hilarious on some level. I like where he goes on later to say, he's like, be it known unto you that henceforward I obey no laws less than the eternal law. I will have no covenants and proximities. I shall endeavor to nourish my parents, to support my family, to be the chaste husband of one wife. Well, I finally disagree with him. But, <laughs> but those relations I must fill after a new and unprecedented way. I appeal from your customs. I must be myself. I cannot break myself any longer for you or you. If you can love me for what I am, 
we should be happier. If you cannot, I will still seek to, to deserve that you should. I will not hide my tastes or aversions. I will still trust that what is deep is holy, that I will do strongly before the sun and moon, whatever inly rejoices me in the heart of points. If you are noble, I will love you. If you are not, I will not hurt you and myself be hypocritical and, my, and myself by hypocritical attentions. If you are true, but not in the same truth with me, cleave to your companions, I will seek my own. I do this not selfishly, but humbly and truly. That part is great. Oh, that's it's so it's if so. You perfect. can love me for what I am. We should be happier. If you cannot, I will still seek to deserve that you should. So, like, even if you don't like me, like, I'm gonna make you respect me. Yeah, and you know, if you are noble, I will love you. If you are not, right? If you're not, if you're not to the to the caliber of person who has honor and you know these sort of values, I'm not gonna hurt you and myself by hypocritical attentions. Like, I'm just not. I'm not gonna like try to spend all my energy to force you to convert to be like me i'm just going to ignore you I'm leave. right and this is like um i believe in putting your message out and your views but i don't believe in reacting to what everybody's doing and constantly complaining and pointing out all the bullshit that's going on right right like i don't i don't believe in that i believe that it's important to live and speak your truth but I think it's bad to it's hypocritical attention, pay a hypocritical attentions to all these things that are lacking in virtue. Like at a certain point, like you realize what's going on already. You don't have to react to every single little thing. Yeah. You need to be focused on production. It's like, okay, what are you building that helps with this or makes things better? Most people are just pointing things out over and over again, reacting to everything getting up in arms about everything. It's like, you already know everything's fucked up. Yeah. You don't have to double down and keep talking about that. Only yeah. focus on what we can do to move forward. Exactly. Exactly. Men find solutions. Men right. find solutions. And, you know, when you do this, right, when you, when you, when you live this way, the populace think, and this is, this is going back to Emerson, this is not my words, the populace think that your rejection of popular standards is a rejection of all standards. And mere anatomianism and the bold sensational uh, sensualist, excuse me, will use the name of philosophy to gild his crimes. So I think the first part of that is the most cutting, in that they think your rejection of popular standards is a rejection of all standards, meaning that like if you don't go along with the 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 big N narrative that you are a lawless, you know, evil beast who's just out to destroy everything and needs to be put put down and dealt with basically. Right. If you don't want to if you don't want to get vaccinated, you're homophobic. If you don't think <laughs> if you don't think men and women are the same, you're racist. Right? Like anything that you disagree with, they think that it's like, "Oh, okay, you hate everyone." Yeah, it's and, and, you know, honestly, that's a trauma response. The more I've been thinking about it, like when people go, when people take a two out of 10 or a three out of 10 and, and, and respond to it with an eight or a nine or a 10 out of 10 in a reaction, trauma response big time. Like that person has not learned to dealt with, you know, differing opinions and hasn't learned to tell them no or has just had, you know, really pretty bad experiences growing up to where that sort of worldview destruction is just not healthy for them. You know what's interesting? Everything is a rejection of popular standards. All sorts of growth. Yeah. Right? Like we had a more traditional society, and then you had all these people making all this perverse art, perverse music, um, pushing feminism, homosexuality, uh, pharmaceuticals, all these things. Like these things were all offensive. They weren't things you could talk about. They were mm -hmm. things that shattered the current narrative of the reality until right. they eventually took over and then now we're doing the same exact thing now yeah. we have to say things that most people find offensive or that are not or that are, don't align with the popular standard like now right. we're back on the offenses as, as opposed to where we're just on the defense and now we got to go back into the offense and i was talking to somebody about this yesterday about like the overton window and how like there's a line in the middle right between us and the other side if you cross that line you're getting into that really offensive territory right but what i and i think what a lot of people how a lot of people mess up 
is they always are just walking up to the line and trying to barely step over it. And they're getting all this hate and criticism for it. What I think it's better to do is completely jump the line and go as far to the other end as you possibly can, right? Because what that does is it moves the line back towards them. It's like going to the extreme so that your less extreme arguments and points seem more acceptable. Like the further you push it, the more they're gonna accept. The problem nowadays is everybody just tries to toe over the line and push the acceptance a little bit. And they're met with the same exact resistance where if they had went all the way. And the problem is now the line's moving back towards them as as opposed to back towards the other side. Interesting. You know? So it's like, it's like um it, this is like how you deal with women, right? Like if I lost money gambling, I would tell my girl like, damn babe, like I really messed up. I just lost like fifty thousand dollars last night. She's gonna be like, "Oh my God, what? Like that's a lot of money." I lost my. I'd be like, "No, I'm just kidding. I only lost five thousand, right?" Like, so I use the big loss to soften up the small one, right? Right. Or like, or like, uh, like, like you know, like in sales too, right? Yeah. You know, like if it's if if the thing's only two thousand bucks, right? You're like, well, it's usually ten thousand, but for you, you know, like people in a when I was in Hawaii, they like to do that. Oh, for you know, this is this is very expensive piece. This is hundreds of dollars, but for you, I do forty. It's like, oh yeah, thanks. Yeah, I'm getting that big big discount. <laughs> yeah, it's the same thing. So like with like the Overton window, it's like I actually try to joke, say the most offensive jokes I possibly can. Yeah. As as opposed to just barely stepping over the line, no, I'll, I'll say the most offensive ones that I can, so that. I'm more free to speak about things that normally before would have really pissed them off. Right now they won't be so upset about it because it's way less extreme. If you ever turn on Owen Benjamin's stream, that's all he does. It's hilarious. Yeah, you have to just make fun of things now. Like that's the way to decode ridiculous things is to make fun of them. Yep. Because it just makes people see how nonsensible they are by pointing yeah. out how by making fun of them, joking about how ridiculous some of these things are and how they, it makes people see that it makes no sense because what makes things funny is the fact that it has truth in it. Like every good piece of humor has a little bit of truth in it. Our, so, our, our relationship to comedy is a lot like a line later when he says, and this is, this is two paragraphs down. He says, we are afraid of truth, afraid of fortune, afraid of death and afraid of each other. Our age yields no great no, and perfect persons. We want men and women who shall renovate life and our social state, but we see that the most natures are insolvent, cannot satisfy their own wants, have an ambition out of all proportion to their practical force, and do lean and beg day and night continually. We, we, it's it's like that shadow of young. It's like a Jungian sort of projection paradox, right? We want these great men to come and fix our environment and fix our society and fix all these things, and yet in our day to day interactions we are keeping everybody like that down and, and making it harder and harder for them to like just exist in a, in a, in a public life. Yeah. I like how he goes to say we are parlor soldiers. We shun the rugged battle of fate where strength is born. Parlor soldier is someone that doesn't actually go to war. Like they're unfit for war. Like they're the type of person that is a, oh, in, a, in, a, in a soldier's uniform, sitting in a parlor or a bar talking about, all the things that soldiers do, but doing none of them. Gotcha. Right. Like, uh, like, 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 like it, would that be very similar to like how the top brass in the military, like hasn't actually seen the war. They've just been in offices their whole life. Right. Exactly. It's the same type of thing. They never touched a battlefield. Right. And we're like that. We're soldiers, but we refuse to fight in the war. We shun the rugged battle of fate. And that's where strength is born. Yep. We don't want to get out in the field. We don't want to, you know, we don't want, we don't want to take L's. We're terrified of taking L's and from feeling like we lost on something, even though, it's you know, the L's, it's, it's, it's risking, it's risky security. It's risking relationships, you know? Yep. And I mean, that all bounces back right here. Right. So this is like, this is my favorite paragraph of yeah the i like i like day. this one too i like this my one favorite too. paragraph of the entire thing so 
If our young men miscarry in their first enterprise, they lose all heart. If the young merchant fails, men say he's ruined. If the finest genius studies at one of our colleges and is not installed in an office within one year afterwards in the cities or suburbs of Boston or New York, it seems to his friends and to himself that he is right in being disheartened and in complaining the rest of his life. A sturdy lad from New Hampshire or Vermont who in turn tries all the professions, who teams it, farms it, peddles, keeps a school, preaches, edits a newspaper, goes to Congress, buys a township, and so forth in successive years, and always, like a cat falls on his feet, is worth a hundred of these city dolls. He walks abreast with his days and feels no shame in not studying a profession, for he does not postpone his life, but lives already. He has not one chance, but a hundred chances. Let a stoic open the resources of man and tell men they are not learning willows, but can and must detach themselves, that with the exercise of self-trust, new power shall appear, that a man is the word made flesh, born to shed healing to the nations, that he should be ashamed of our compassion, and that the moment he acts from himself, tossing the laws, the books, the idolatries, and customs out the window, we pity him no more, but thank and revere him, and that teacher shall restore the life of man to splendor and make his name dear to all history. That's, that's one of a my, lot. That's one of, yeah, that's a lot. That's one of my favorite paragraphs. Um, the first thing I really noticed is in the beginning, he talks about all these people who took the easy way or the, the correct, the quote unquote correct path. They right. went to high school, they got into college, they got a job and then they worked in that for years trying to grow up a chain. People like that can't handle failure. They can't handle random events. They can't handle lack of security because they have this, they live in this like pre laid out structure. Like everything about their life is prefab, like it's prefabricated and pre-made. And if anything happens outside of that, they don't know how to deal with it. They crash and burn tremendously. But the young man who comes from a more sturdy place and who believed him himself and, and didn't know what he was going to do or what he wanted to be, but just knew he wanted to be free and was willing to take try anything to do that and went from one place to the other, nothing can break him because he's been up and down so many times that nothing affects him. And he's the one that actually ends up gaining the true power and the true respect and the true honor because he's the one that's able to, like a cat, land on his feet no matter the what happens, no matter the calamity. Whereas people who have this prefab life and everything laid out for them, any sort of deviation breaks them. Right. Well, and I mean that first that, that first line hits so many of like, especially this corner where there's a lot of young guys looking to start businesses and like you know kind of break the societal narrative in a sense. You know, like one of the biggest problems is that they'll They'll see a business, you know, doing really well by somebody else. They'll go to try to imitate it and they'll fail. And, you know, a lot of guys that, that you never hear from them again. And it's so sad because all that dude had to do was just try again. That's all he had to do. Yeah. What you understand is like you have a hundred chances. Like you going all in on a business, you have more options than the person that went all in on one college or career path. Because if that career path doesn't work out for them, they're screwed. If your business doesn't work out, you can try another one. Yep. That's a good way to do it. You have limitless options, whereas other people can find themselves to one path of success. Right. Like the worst thing is it felt because it felt safer. Yes. And because other people told them that it was the best thing to do. And because they felt it would make their parents proud, prouder of them. They pick they boxed themselves in to only one option. And if I mean, that fails, it's powerful, over. Powerful, 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 powerful. I mean, yeah, like you said, it feels safer. Not necessarily is because think of all the think of all the people, right? I, I, I don't think a lot of people are thinking about this right now. Think of all the people at this very moment who are getting degrees in something that are going to be taken out by an AI or just not going to exist in five years. Like all those people, they, they, they have this perception of safety, but it's going to come crashing down one day. And that's not going to be pretty. Yeah, and I'm the opposite of every of what like all these big tech guys will tell you because they're like, oh, AI and robotics is going to create a whole new different industry 
just like uh, the internet did or just like automobiles did. And I'm like, no, it's not. It's going to eliminate industries like nothing else that we've ever seen before. I don't think this is going to spawn a new um, workforce that's technology based. It's like, no, like the technology is going to do the work. You don't need the new workforce this time. So it's yeah, only a great excuse to lower labor costs. That's for sure. Right. You know, and like, oh, it's going to create all sorts of new jobs and new industries. Not this time. Nope. And then, you know, that part, that, that, that part later, a sturdy lad from New Hampshire, Vermont, right? And he lists all those things, right? That train, is, that's train everything. Yep. Yep. That's like, he tries it, all the professions and teams, this, teams it, forms it, pedals yep, it. Yep. Yep. Preaches yep. it. And it's a newspaper goes to Congress by the time. It's like, think of it this way too. Think of it this way. Just, just take out your own life, right? Just act like you're reading a story, right? Doesn't this dude's life seem so much more fun and enjoyable and engaging? And like, you want to be with that guy rather than the dude is like, yeah, I just got my uh, job in New York, uh, but it's, I only get 60,000 a year, right? This dude's like, all right, I'm going to farm, I'm going to pedal and go, boom, boom, boom. Like he's doing a bunch of things, right? Just from a pure story level, if you think of life as a narrative, that just seems more fun at the end of the day, right? If you want to maximize your fun and engagement out of life, this is definitely the way to go. It's more fun, it's more exciting, and it's more experience, which means more skill. Yep. Like, I, I bet, you know, think of that, that sturdy lad versus the city doll, right? Imagine them if, 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 when they're both 50 years old, right? Who's going to have lived more in those 50 years? Definitely the sturdy lad. Right. Who's going to be the more interesting grandfather? Yep. Exactly. Exactly. It's going to be the guy with all the experiences. Exactly. Exactly. There we go. Okay. So now do you have something else? Next part we have is prayer, right? So the ne- I'd like to preface this part because there's it's it's kind of structured in a certain way. Uh, basically, the, the the rest of the rest of self reliance, he basically breaks down the uh, the fo- the four kind of tenets of what it is like where you can see self reliance and how it can be implemented in your life properly. And it goes the first one is prayer. And in what he opens up with like almost a lamentation and what, I mean, what prayers do men allow themselves that which they call a holy office is not so much as brave as, and manly prayer looks abroad and asks for some foreign addition to come through some foreign virtue and loses itself in endless mazes of natural and supernatural and meditorial and miraculous prayer that craves particular commodity. Anything less than all good is vicious. Prayer is the contemplation of the facts of life from the highest point of view. Now, I think it's powerful as hell because it just kind of throws the whole, whole, whole public note, whole, whole, the whole like modern notion of like praying for something just out the window. Yes, because most people are just praying for God to give them things. Yeah. Right. And like that's what he's saying. That's not the right form of prayer. Prayer is the contemplation of the facts of life from the highest point of view. To me, that sounds like gratitude. Because the facts of life from the highest point of view is that you should be grateful for all that you have. Very true. When, you're, when you're looking at it from the top down, just at, at bare bones and essentials. So like when you're just praying for God to give you things, that's a vicious prayer. You should be praying for the strength to do what it takes to get those things. I, I, I like to think of it like this, like when you pray, you take, yeah, like you said, you take the bird's eye view and you kind of, you, you ask for the courage to take the right path. You ask for the path and like the, the light and a hint and like a direction. You're not asking for God, give me a million dollars, please. I'm a good boy. And I, you know, I'm doing all my things and you know what? I'm just, I'm so sad. I just really need a million dollars right now. I'd make a lot of, no, 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 no. You ask for, give me the courage to figure out how to make, how to make a million dollars. Give me the courage to like, self-sustain my family for generations to come show me the path i need to take show me the hard actions i need to take to get the goal i need that's what you need to be praying for yeah 100 percent. he said prayer as a means to affect the private end is meanness and theft it supposes dualism and not unity in nature and consciousness so when he says like it supposes dualism it kind of reminds me of a 
quote that I read before that's like, as soon as you desire something, you separate yourself from that thing. Yes, yes. Immediately thought of that too. Right? So you create duality. You create a gap between yourself and what you desire just by wanting it. But what you really need to do is start seeing yourself as it or as something or seeing it as something that is destined for you and preordained to you and something that you deserve and something that you're willing to work for or to earn. You know, as soon as a man is at one with, with God, he will not beg. He will then see prayer in all action. Because at the end of the day, prayer doesn't make faith work. Work makes faith work. Right? Like James wrote, faith without works is like, uh, oh shit, what was it? Something, something, you, you, you had it, I think. Just, yeah, I, I, I've heard that quote before, but it's like, you need to act. God, God or the universe, whatever you believe, it doesn't work by wishing. It's like, shit in one hand, wish in the other, see which one fills up faster, right? Like you got to go ahead and actually get in the dirt and grind things away. And then your prayers will come to fruition. Uh, he will see prayer in all action. The prayer of the farmer kneeling in his field to weed it, the prayer of the rower kneeling, kneeling with the stroke of his oar, are true prayers heard throughout nature, though for cheap ends. I, I found so, it. This is James... Uh... James 2.17, for anybody who has a King James Version. Thus, also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. Boom. Right there. If you're not acting on it, if you're not if you're not actively using this, this three-dimensional realm to pursue your things and what you want and what you feel you need, then it's not going to come. And I like it says, the prayer of the, far, of the farmer kneeling in his field to weed it, the prayer of the rower kneeling with the stroke of his oar, those are true prayers heard throughout nature. So basically, God doesn't hear you unless you take the action as well. The action is the prayer that's heard, heard throughout nature. Very true. Yeah. It's, you know, it's almost like prayers, prayers and assistance, prayers wind to the sails, but from the dude who's already ventured out into the sea. Then he goes on to say, another sort of false prayer are our regrets. Regret calamities, if you can thereby help the sufferer. If not, attend your own work, and already the evil begins to repair. I think he's actually saying this kind of tongue-in-cheek, where he's saying, regret calamities, if you can thereby help the sufferer. Like, most of the time, you can't. Like, your regret, if, it's, if you've suffered the trauma, regretting it doesn't help you at all. No. And if someone else suffers a trauma, regretting it for them doesn't really help them at all. You can be there for emotional support for them. That yeah. can help them, right? But as soon as you attend to your work, he says, already the evil begins to be repaired. Right. If your kid falls and like breaks his leg in the skateboard, you don't go, oh, I really regret like getting him that skateboard and all that stuff. No, you go, oh shit, I'm bringing him to a hospital. Like let's get that, let's get that splinted up. Right, you, you get that wood out, you, you you gauze it up. You're not sitting there regretting. Right. Yeah. No. The, you gotta. Um, you can't. You can't unpray things. You can't pray things from ha unpray things for happening. Like for make them unhappen by praying. Right. Like it already happened. Like no. All you can do is go to your work now. Like we come to them who weep foolishly and sit down and cry for company instead of imparting them truth and health and rough electric shocks putting them once more in communication with their own reason, right? That's like when, you know, when the kid falls, you don't go, oh, I must hurt really bad. Oh, that's, that's deep. No, you go, it's okay. It's okay. You're fine. You're fine. It's just a script, right? You tell, you, you bring them back to reality. Welcome evermore to gods and men is the self-helping man. Mm. For him, for him, all doors are flung wide. Him, all tongues greet, all honors crown. All eyes follow with desire. This is my favorite part. Our love goes out to him and embraces him because he did not need it. We, solicitous, we solicitous, solicitously and apo apologetically caress and celebrate him because he held on his way and scorned our 
expiation. The gods love him because men hated him. That that's one of my favorite parts in the whole essay. Is where yeah. like he goes, our love goes out to him and embraces him because he did not need it. And this is all what he's been. T- this is like just all the self reliant stuff we've been talking about. Full circle is that this is what we're talking about with all those great men and how you honor, respect them. You love them, and you respect them because they they didn't need it from you. That in itself is honorable. Right. Um, perfect. Yeah. Perfect we, thing right there. It's an outcome independence. Right. We we celebrate him because he held on his way when others disapproved. And he said, the gods love him because men hated him. So God loves you when you're following intuition and truth, which make and it makes other men may hate you, but God loves you because of it. Because you're aligned with the universal word and truth. That's just so next level. Yeah, it really is. The gods love him because men hated him. It's amazing. <laughs> That's so next level. That's... You know, and it's just like it even goes back to like the the first level, the first uh, one of the first stories in the Bible with Cain and Abel. Right. God loved him. Man because God him. God loved his brother more. Yep. 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 So man, and then so man hated him. Yep. It's God. Jeez. Yeah. It's like. It's like, I mean, Peterson has talked to this, had talked the story to death, but it's, you know, it's like, it's, it's lashing out at, at the, at the nature of the world because it, it seems to favor another person over, over you, right? Instead of focusing on what can I do better, you lash out on the other person for basically just no, at the end of the day, no reason. You're just, you're just mad. Well, it's because it's that alienated majesty and that shame we feel. Like he talked about in the very first paragraph about not living in terms of the light and beam that flashes across our mind and letting watching other people live it and bring shame upon us. Yeah, because you know you could be doing way better. Because you know you could you know you could be doing the same exact thing. You know you could be doing way better. And instead of instead of you know, instead of just fixing that, you lash out and you cause damage to the other person who's trying you know, to ascend themselves and just makes the whole thing worse as we saw with Cain and Abel. <laughs> exactly. And then I think from there, um, do you have anything else for this? No, I think, I think we, I think, I think, I think prayer, I think prayer would pretty much have gone through. Is there anything you want to talk about in the next paragraph? Yeah. The next one is traveling, right? Yeah. So, so this, why don't this, we hit on traveling? This, will be this, fun one's, for you. this one's actually great. You know, um, uh, this is gonna make a lot of y'all mad. It's gonna make a lot of y'all mad. I'm gonna read this in like a paraphrase way. Yeah, let's do it. But um, it starts off. He says, "It is for want of self culture that the superstition of traveling, whose idols are Italy, England, Egypt, retains its fascination for all educated Americans." In manly hours, or you like this part? He said. They who made England, Italy, or Greece venerable in the imagination did so by sticking fast where they were, like an axis of the earth. Huh, digital nomads. <laughs> <laughs> in manly hours, we feel the duty is our place. We feel that duty is our place. The soul is no traveler. The wise man stays at home. And when his necessities, his duties, on any occasion call him from his house or into foreign lands, he is at home still and shall make men sensible by the expression of his countenance, that he goes the missionary of wisdom and virtue, and visits cities and men like a sovereign, and not like an interloper or a valet. So that opening there was really fire when I read it, because I think about these digital nomads. I think about girls who their personality type is they like to travel, and everybody's all over the world trying to find themselves. But what's really going on is that like, he says in manly hours. So I think that's what that means is like, when you actually live like a man, right? And like actually act like a man, you'll understand that duty is your place. And the wise man stays at home, but when he needs to, and his duties call him, he travels into foreign lands. But when he travels, he's still at home. Right, he's in his mission. He's still inside of his element. Right, he's not 
running from something or trying to find another piece of himself he the he brings himself wherever he goes like and he's going to talk about this later but he says that the by the sensible expression of his countenance which is a look on your face he's the missionary of wisdom and virtue and he visits like a sovereign rather than like a tourist so it's like when you go to a city or a new place and like when i go to new places i rarely do all the tourist stuff i try to live like someone that actually lives there yeah because that way i'm more myself just experiencing a different place rather than i feel like a follower of the the herd of the crowd just going to all the spectacles for like yeah. a picture or you got to do the things right to get the posts to get the social credit right it's like right. nah, i'm gonna go and i'm like yeah all, all 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 my all the friends who travel that travel really well like they they throw their bag in the hotel the airbnb and they go down like the the off-beaten path and they just stay there the whole time he goes, and he says, I have no churlish objection to the circumnavigation of the globe for the purpose of art, of study, and benevolence. So it's not bad to travel, but for the right reasons, right? Like, I think what we see a lot of today is, like, it's done internally for the wrong reasons. Like, when you really get deep down to it, people are traveling so that people think they're more cultured or think they have all this experience or that they're smarter or think that they're more successful. Like, very few people are traveling just for the pure joy of learning about another culture or just seeing beautiful works of art that have been created by man or by nature. Most of the people are just doing it because of the perception that other people are going to have of them. You know, he, um, he who travels to be amused or to get somewhat, which de- which he does not carry travels away from himself. You're traveling to look to find something that you don't have internally you're only traveling further away from it. Like he right? says, he says, I pack my trunk, embrace my friends, embark on the sea, and at last wake up in Naples. And there beside me is the stern fact, the sad self, unrelenting, identical, that I fled from. I seek the Vatican and the palaces. I affect to be intoxicated with sights and suggestions, but I'm not intoxicated. My giant goes with me wherever I go. Yeah, that's, that's wild. So he's basically saying, like, all these people that are going in, all over the place to try to find themselves, they're going to find that all they've done is brought all their problems with them. Like if you can't fix yourself where you are going and hanging out in Bali for a month, isn't going to make you more enlightened or fix your problems for you. No, no. Like everything you that's going on internally is going to go with you wherever you go. And you know, I even had a, another thought of this because I actually thought about this. I went, I recently went to a South American country. I won't say the name of it because I don't want everybody to go there. But uh, when I was there, it's like I had decided that, oh, you know, I was kind of going to go Ronin for a little bit and just roam around, explore the world a little bit. And I got there and I was like, you know what? This is kind of stupid. Like I was by myself for a month, basically. And I thought this experience was going to like make me learn something new or make me feel more in touch with myself. But all I felt was that it's kind of a waste of time having these experiences when you don't have anyone to share it with at the end of the day. Like in life, all you can really have at the end of the day is relationships and experiences. You can't have things. Things aren't real. They come and go, right? All the, all you have is your relationship with other people and the things that you've experienced in life. And then I realized with those experiences, they're better when you share them with people you have relationships with. So at the end of the day, like you got a re- relationship maxing is what you should be doing because you can go and have, be this digital nomad and travel all the world by yourself. It's not as great without having people you love and care about to share it with. There we go. Like, don't get me wrong. Maybe you have a good time or everything, but it's just not the same. And at the end of the day, every moment you spend doing that is, is the, a moment away from building something solid and yeah. something real. Like every moment I spend on vacation or traveling is a moment I'm not tilling the land or building uh, a house or planting a tree that my grandchildren will sit under. Yeah. You know, like traveling for experience, just if you, if that's your purpose, it, it shows that you do not know how to 
reap the full experience of the world around you in your immediate surroundings. So let's, yeah, like, again, it speaks more to the inner character. Now he, you know, two is very short. Two is only about three paragraphs. And then he, but three is kind of a continuation of that on like a, the deeper level. He, it's like, but the rage of traveling is a symptom of a deeper unsoundness affecting the whole intellectual action. I'm going to skip a bit. He says, we imitate and what is imitation, but the traveling of the mind, right? We try to put our mind around other people's works and try to make it our own and it never comes out properly, right? Our houses are built with foreign tastes. Our shelves are garnished with foreign ornaments. Our opinions, our tastes, our faculties lean and follow the past and the distant. That's kind of what we were just talking about, about the two sides, one oriented towards a pathological future and one oriented towards a distant past. Right. Yeah. You know, like, it's like, especially this is actually so relevant because especially in America, like, our houses are built with foreign tastes. Our shelves are garnished with foreign ornaments. Our opinions, our tastes, our faculties lean and follow the path of the distance. That's like all of globalism now, where it's like there's very little distinguishable cultures. Like everybody's just the same Western culture now, and the same yeah. identity. Like people wear their clothes the same here as they do in Western Europe, or girls have the same ideologies, or people watch the same movies and the same tv shows it's like every everything's all bunched together where it's like we don't have anything original like what is american culture now you know it's just american right. culture is basically just whatever hollywood is at the moment in time yeah it's the monoculture you know and it's all imported where where are our great where are our are, are emersons and thoreaus and teddy roosevelt's now yeah, we've abandoned that. Amer the, the American spirit got co-opted and, and the development, the development of the American aesthetic and the American way got co-opted in the in the 20th century. And it wasn't able to naturally flourish and continue. Yeah, it's gone. Like the culture that made this country strong and powerful doesn't exist anymore. No. And it's fading more and more every day. Yep. Yep. It's a sad thing. But the thing is, is that the the solutions are not to go oh we have to convert back to the 1800s like no no it's not gonna first of all it's not gonna work second of all it's it, it's like you don't want to do that actually you want the like and that's that's the whole thing with the aesthetic posters and the trad posters is that you're tw you 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 want this farm homestead lifestyle you know pregnant barefoot wife all that stuff you, you live in a suburban place in your mom's house or you live in a city right and you're not and you're not going out in the world and building that you're just like it's just pornography at that point right everything on the internet is porn yeah i wrote a thread about this it's actually one of my most popular ones yeah everything is well it's right? talking about your, your visions and goals should ex exist in your mind's eye like and should only be able to see them by taking the time to actually work and bring those things into reality as opposed to just seeing pictures of it and posting it like uh, the goals or aesthetics or return or whatever. It's like, yeah. no, like all this stuff is just pointless mental masturbation. Like yeah. if you really want it, visualize it in your mind and then give yourself the, the, the only relief you can get in terms of seeing it or feeling like it's happening is from building it. Yes yes make it so yeah make it so the only way you can rest soundly is if it's built if it's created well i like i like this part here uh, insist on yourself never imitate your own gift you can present every moment with the cumulative force of a whole life's cultivation but of the adopted talent of another you have only an extemporaneous half possession so this is great Yes, you can own. You can be a hundred percent of yourself, but you only could be fifty percent of somebody else. Yes. So I was talking about with like you can't go be Shakespeare. You just can't. Right. Like if you try to be someone else, you're never going to be able to do it. The only person you can actually be is yourself. Anyone else, you have a half possession. But if you're yourself, you can present it every moment with the cumulative force of a whole life's cultivation. You know, that which each can do best, none but his maker can teach him. No man yet knows what it is, nor can, till that person has exhibited it, until that person has exhibited it. So what you're capable of, only you and God or the universe knows that. Right. And you can never know what that is until you go for it. 
Right. Imagine all the millions of people today that are just not living out their full gifts. It's it's like all all the all the ideas and the potential just like just, just carried into into the afterlife to never be shown. And, and this reminds me of what I said earlier. This, uh, if you want to be like me, be yourself. Where's the master that could have taught Shakespeare? Every great man is unique. Shakespeare will never be made by the study of Shakespeare. Do that yeah. which is assigned to you, and you cannot hope too much or dare too much. Yes. A society, a society is weighed down by the collective creative debt of its dead. And when, you know, when you're not, when, you know, it's like literally like that, that early 2000s, like be yourself advice, that's, that's actually true. It's just be improving yourself too. Not just like let your flaws flop out there, but like just embody yourself better. You know, and you know what this whole paragraph reminds me of? It says the worst thing in the world is not dying. It's dying and then God showing you who you could have been. Oh, jeez, dude. Imagine and that. The life, and the life you could have lived. Oh, my gosh. Imagine and that's, that. And that's what this talks about. It's like <sighs> no one but you and God knows what's possible for you. And oh, you'll never God. know if you push it. And no matter what, you've already missed out on a ton of it. You, you will never be at your full potential. Now, this is not a nihilistic thing. This means you just, it's, it actually should be motivational because there's really no cap on what you can do and there's no limit, but you yeah. probably already missed it. So this is why you shouldn't slack and you shouldn't approach life impassionately and with no drive and desire because you've already missed out on the best you can. And, and the more that you are lazy and the more that you take things for granted and waste time the the bigger the dreams are that die right knowing now think of what you could have done earlier with this knowledge you have now and like think of all the wasted time and energy that you put into things right you got to get moving there's a lot right. more for you to do right there's a lot more for you to do and, and still you can have a life beyond your imagination but you just have to, but that's between you and your maker. Yep. And only you can decide that. No one else knows what you're capable of. You might have a slight idea. Like I think everybody, I know for myself, I have like an internal idea of what I'm capable of. And like I've always said, I don't think I'm, op I'm probably operating. And you should, this is actually something you should do is try to get an assessment of yourself. Mm -hmm. I'm probably operating at... 15% of my potential max. Yeah. I could be operating at such a higher level and that's all I'm trying to do on an everyday basis is realize more potential. And guys, guys, if you, if you, if you're listening to this, that's Lo this is Lobo saying 15%, right? So if you're like, oh, a little bit off, maybe like 80%, boy, you are probably closer to like 0 0.1. Yeah. If you're like saying that. The no, higher you, the higher you think you are, the the lower you probably actually are. I remember listening to an Earl Nightingale tape, and they did a study on like um, hydrogen atoms in the human body. Okay. And they're like, if the average person could utilize the hydrogen atoms in their body properly, like for energy, the average person could could fulfill the energy needs for the entire United States for weeks. Wow. So that places the worth that he did like the calculation where he's like, it places the worth of each person as like trillions of dollars <sighs> or like billions of dollars. So like you're worth, you're actually physically literally worth billions, right? That's With the, ener the energy just inside the hydrogen atoms in your body. That's so incredible. when you're thinking about how close you are to your full potential, you have to realize that you have enough energy inside you to power this entire country for weeks. That's insane. That's actually, uh, I, I didn't know that. I've never even thought about I, that. My number, my, the exact math might be like a little bit off, but it's definitely power in the country for weeks and definitely makes you worth billions of dollars. That's insane. That's insane. There's a way to tap into that. And we're yeah. just, we're not, we're not, we're not fully doing that now. Okay. So that was, that was the whole thing on traveling. Now, this is the, 
last section of self-reliance, and this is uh, basically, he's basically looking at the meta of society. Like this is basically a final look at, at, at society and how it's structured and um, kind of the, the, the failings in it that he was able to spot, right? But guys, you, you need to take all this into context too. Emerson was speaking on all of these, and these are all still very relevant issues to us. He was sp- speaking about this in the mid 1800s, yeah. mid 1800s, <laughs> right? Like, this is pre Civil War stuff. This is, you know, so th- think about how much has changed since the Civil War. We have the exact same issues, right? There's nothing new under the sun. So he says, as our religion, our education, our art look abroad, so does our spirit of society. All men plume themselves in the improvement of society, and no man improves. Society never advances. It recedes as fast on one side as it gains on the other. It undergoes continual changes. It is barbarous. It is civilized. It is Christianized. It is rich. It is scientific. But this change is not an amelioration. Am I saying that right? Amelioration. Amelioration. Right. For everything that is given, something is taken. Now, this is such a critical maxim right here for everything that is given something is taken society acquires new arts and loses all instincts what a contrast between the well-clad reading writing thinking american with a watch pencil and a bill of exchange in his pocket and the naked new zealander whose property is a club a spear a mat and an undivided twelfth of a shed to sleep under but compare the health of the two men and you shall see that the white man has lost his aboriginal strength if the traveler tells us truly, strike the savage with a broad axe, and in a day or two the flesh shall unite and heal as if you struck the blow into soft pitch, and the same blow shall send the white to his grave. So this is amazing because he's talking about society never advances. It recedes as fast as one side on the other. For everything gain, we lose something. I wrote a post in Telegram recently where I said that convenience represents skills lost. Right. So as the world gets more convenient and more comfortable, we lose skills. So because you have an oven, you don't know how to start a fire. Because you have running water, you don't know how to find water or tell if water is drinkable. Because you have a grocery store, you don't know how to hunt and grow things. So what seems like progress is also regression on one end. You know, just like we have a safe and secure society, we're also now have the weakest and softest bodies possible because we we're protected from nature protected from wild animals right and our food is guaranteed for us so now it's like we've actually gotten physically weaker and are declining so as much as you see things progress on one end there's also a regression these these two things are united yes yes you know and And like even if you want to go you want to return and go back to the way things are okay that's fine there's going to be more order but there's going to be less freedom as well yeah and i mean seriously there's a give and take for everything Seriously, dude, everybody who says return, 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 you throw them right back in the like 1700, they don't last a week. <laughs> they don't last a week. Yeah. The, the, the thing I'm thinking of too, like the, the most pressing thing for me with this is like, think about GPS, right? Think about how, you know, I, I was thinking about this the other day. Like, yeah, I man, was thinking about this too. I was thinking about GPS. <laughs> man, exactly. like, like, we our cities are so big now they're so drawn out that if i didn't have gps i would have been screwed so many times like i would have actually been annihilated in some of these cities like my cars would have run out of gas in la because i don't understand how la was built if anybody who lives there understands that you you, you get what i mean right um you know like just finding being able to find things right and not have to rely on memory and not have to rely on direction and orientation and like where the sun is and you know uh how how long i've been out on the road all these different things you don't have to have these things inside of your head and just imagine all like the 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 primal neural systems that are just not being fired because we can just go hey siri map me map me into mcdonald's please yeah now we're starting to outsource all of our intelligence and all of our senses of the environment around us like we're not even taking in the environment around us anymore or taking information from it because we don't need to yeah you know when like actually being able to scan the environment and get really concise information out of it is one of the things that make humans superior to other animals you know and he talks about he says the civilized man has built a coach but has lost the use of his feet this was a good one for me because like 
I think about just how people can't walk in general, where it's like they have horrible gaits, they suck at r- running properly, uh, their bodies are all out of whack, their foot strikes horrible, their feet are deforming and collapsing, but they've got cars and chairs everywhere, you know, but it's destroyed their body for those yeah, things. Yeah, it's almost dysgenic. You know? Yeah, he is supported on crutches, but lacks so much supportive muscle. He has a fine Geneva watch, but he fails of the skill to tell the hour by the sun. A Greenwich nautical almanac he has. And so being sure of the information when he wants it, the man in the street does not know a star in the sky. That was so key right there. So being sure of the information when he wants it, the man in the street does not know a star in the sky. So because we have, it's so funny, we have access to all of this information right at our fingertips. And we feel confidence in that, that when we want it to find it, when we need to find the answer, it's there. So what that does is it actually makes us not find the answer at all. We don't seek the answer because we know it's there if we ever truly needed it. But the thing is, is we actually need it right now. Like I, I, the, I read through this a couple times and like the first two times there were words I didn't know the answer. I didn't know the definition to, I didn't even look it up. And then I read this paragraph again and I was like, what the hell am I doing, man? Like I have access to all the information possible pretty much that's ever been compiled. And I don't even use it simply because it's just there. You take it for granted. I have that exact same problem, bro, where I will read something and I won't understand a word. And my first drive will be "Eh, whatever. I'll just keep reading. Instead, I should be like, what is that word? Because this, that could be a sentence that unlocks a totally new paradigm in your life. If you just understood that one word. Right. Like I'm like that now, whenever I come across something that I don't know, I don't understand. Like I'm, I start looking it up Yeah. because it, it, it has a funny way of always popping up again. And when it does, I always feel retarded for not looking it up that first time for having that confusion. But it's like you can grow and learn so much every day just by not leaving yourself in confusion about things and not being lazy and trusting the fact that just because you have access to it, that means you understand it. No, you don't understand it at all. I went to a new town where I recently bought a house and I remember driving around for like the first three days. I was using GPS for everything. And after like three or three or four days, I talked I ended up talking to this guy who was a local there. And I I couldn't even explain where things were to him because I was looking for something and telling him about where the house was. And I couldn't even explain it. I didn't even know the names of the roads or anything. I had driven them a dozen times already. But because I outsourced everything to the GPS. I didn't actually learn anything about in my environment and had very, like I had small orientations, but really didn't know my way around. I was like, wow, that's amazing. You could have something. It made me so weak. Like I bet if I didn't use the GPS, I would know exactly where I need to go and have it burned into my memory. It wouldn't take long. It would take a couple of days. Right. But because I kept relying on this outside source, I didn't end up actually learning anything. The solstice he does not observe, the equinox he knows as little, and the whole bright calendar of the year is without a dial on his mind. His notebooks impair his memory, his libraries overload his wit. The insurance office increases the number of accidents, and it may be a question whether machinery does not encumber, whether we have not lost by refinement some energy, by Christianity and transcend establishments and forms, some vigor of wild virtue. For every stoic was a stoic, but in Christendom, where is the Christian? <laughs> this is great. You know, he's talking about like whether the machinery does not encumber because of all the machines we have doing all our work for us. We've lost some energy and some life force in us. Yes. Yes. Oh, and now yeah. we have I mean, Christianity, the great was... order from us, ordering us, but now we, we lack vigor and wild virtue. It's insane. It's insane leave <laughs> and it's so funny because it, it, the, well, he's like the stoics live their ideology but where are the christians living there <laughs> yeah we, we built up this whole society and yet we have this like massive we have, e- e- even people who call themselves christians are, are just atheists there's just a huge huge bent towards this like atheism this like lack of spirituality just permeates every level of our culture 
Now, this is the part after this, right? This is this is something that I, I, I wrestle with because it's so hard for me to see this in our and in, in everything that's going on. He says, there's no more deviation in the moral standard than in the standard of height or bulk. No greater men are now than ever were. And this is something I'm like, is this true? Does this feel true to you, Lobo, right now? Yes. It feels yes. true. It, it, that there's no greater men are now than ever were. There's, there's the same amount of great men. Oh. Mm, does he mean there's no no greater men? I think he's saying that there's no deviation. There's like no change. It's like the same standard deviation throughout time of great men. There's no greater men now than there ever were. I don't. I don't think there's as great a men now. I am. I'm. I. I. I have to agree. Honestly. Yeah. I think there's a there's a void. I think people make as big of an impact. Like people are making bigger impacts on the world than anyone ever before. Like the, the iPhone and the internet affected the world more than Caesar did. But who knows though? We're still we don't know because we're still living in the shadows of old societies. Like yeah. what happened with the Greeks, what happened with the Romans, what happened with the Renaissance, what happened with the French Revolution, those still reverberate reverberate to this day reverberate you know right. like we're still living in the effects of these events right and yeah it's like, well and in a, in a, in a for example like washington right washington was just like a normal general like he was like he even didn't even have good of like a win loss record right he was just kind of a normal general and you know but he when the time came for him to be called upon he came up to the task and he became a, a huge creator of history right so Maybe people just aren't. Maybe the heroes just aren't awake right now, or something, or like something just isn't ready. Well, we gotta know. see what time says, right? Like in a thousand years, how do you think they're gonna talk about Elon Musk? Say we become like an interplanetary species or something. Yeah. Right. Like, yeah. is he gonna be like an as fabled as like an Alexander or Genghis Khan or Isaac Newton or you know like Copernicus? Pythagoras, like, are they going to look at them the same way in a thousand years? If people are living for on as much as I'm, twenty yeah. different planets, you know. For as much as I'm skeptical of his intentions, oh, I am as, I am he as well. This, this is not an endorsement of him. No, no, but I'm saying, like, yeah, yeah, like, for as skeptical as as he is, like, he does fill that frame of like the Galileo, the Copernicus guy, like pushing, you know, the the science and technology boundaries to new levels, but. Yeah, it's weird. It's weird. I, I think we I, it's hard to say. Like, it, I think the problem is we don't respect the men of today as much as the men back then. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right? You know, well, there's, there's a few, like, you know, I think I think in a few, I think, you know, in, in, in 10 years or so, people like Joel Salatin will be seen with much higher regard and will be um, looked upon. You know more than somebody like Neil deGrasse Tyson. I would hope so. In a in a in a virtuous and right world, it would be that way. Yeah, yeah. I yeah. So it's, it's something like that has to happen. I think just by the just by the pendulum of time. Something, because I, I agree. Like the society that we live in right now is very pathological, and so we don't want to res we don't we don't have an urge or we don't find anything to respect about our leaders or so-called leaders it's like a very uh so it's a it's a strange relationship yeah, i think i think this have. is a par like a paragraph i need to understand more yeah this is th this was my least understood part of the whole book surprisingly yeah yeah, I'd have to read that again. What else did I? What I, I got some underlying parts in this paragraph. What did I underline? All right. Society is a wave. The wave moves onward, but the water of which it is composed does not. That was that was insightful for me, because although everything 
follows a structure and history, history repeats itself, the events are random. So right. it's orderly chaos. Right. Human nature itself is the same, but how, how things all get together are very different. You know, with natural disasters and technology and the, the phasing in and out of belief systems and stuff. Oh, this was this. All right. This is this is important. He says men have looked away from themselves and at things so long that they have come to esteem the religious, learned and civil institutions as guards of property. And they deprecate assaults on these because they fill them to be assaults on property. They measure their. All right. So this, this mm. is actually interesting because we look away from ourselves and that thing so long that we have esteem for religions and institutions and governments as guards of property. And we hate assaults on these things because we feel them to be assaults from our property. Like all of our laws are basically to protect property and individual safety, right? So we see a lot of attacks on these things as attacks on our freedoms and our rights to property and and, and whatnot. Um, let's see. They measure their esteem of each other by what each has and not by what each is. But a cultivated man becomes ashamed of his property out of new respect for his nature. Especially he hates what he has if he sees that it is accidental, came to him by inheritance or gift or crime. Then he feels that it is not having, it does not belong to him, has no root in him, and merely lives there because no revolution or no robber takes it away. This is uh, what I've said before. I, I can't make money in a dishonorable way because I wouldn't feel yes. that I deserve it. And a lot of people like the, you know, the Tate Brothers thing. Everyone's like, oh, I gotta get my OnlyFans hair up. It's like, I could, I could actually never Yeah, do that. I couldn't do it. I could never click I could, up. I couldn't do it. I have the ability to do it, but I couldn't actually do it. I wouldn't be able to look at myself in the mirror if I did grimy things to make money. If I believed a certain, like if I believe, which is interesting because they, I, I like them, but they have a lot of opposing views. Like they believe men are weak and they're trying to teach men strength, but they also took advantage of weak men. Right. You know, so it's like, for me, I have to be, it's not about what I have. Like, it's not about, it's about how I got it. If I had to get it by unjust mm. means or by trickery or by lies, then I'll be ashamed of it. If it was, if I yes. inherited it, you know, it, it wouldn't be mine. Like he says, it hasn't, it does not belong to you. It has no root in you. And it only, it's only there because no revolution, no robber took it away. Right. Right. Yeah. I mean, definitely the, the, the mean, means are very important. A lot of us are very focused on ends in this current age, getting, getting the things right. Uh, you know, Hollywood. Stuff, just getting, getting the movies, but they, you know, they, they disregarded the means. And then now every single day they're living with the consequences of that. And that's what drains you. And that's what brings you down completely. Yeah. So you have to live in a way that I, and this is just beyond money. You have to live in such a way that you can look at yourself in the mirror because you can hide these things. You can do shameful, reprehensible, dishonorable things and nobody will know and the world won't notice. And you know what? In today's world where it's based off dishonesty and dishonor, you're probably going to do well. But when you go to sleep at night and there's no one around and it's just you in your head, you have to live with the fact that you know that you're a scumbag. And for me, I try not to live in a way where I'm disappointed in myself. So like, yeah. and this isn't even about make money it's just like daily actions like eating bullshit watching porn uh wasting time on netflix series uh not working out like all those things are great in the moment but you deep down you're going to be ashamed of yourself when you go to bed at night yep. those things torture you those are what emerson yep. talks about earlier they're a deliverance that does not deliver they're delivering you yep. 
away from work and toil and stress, but they're actually making mm-hmm. everything worse. It doesn't save you at all. No, it's like a little trap door, but then you eventually have to walk out of the cellar right. again. It's like continue the, the things life. you think bring you pleasure, bring you pain. And the things, the things you think bring you pain actually end up bringing you pleasure in the long run. Yep. There we go. There we go. You know, um, yeah, and then just, just one more point on the reliance of property too, right? Like, I mean, we, we can even take this in a super literal sense, right? When we turn away and we, we're so focused on like just random, you know, like working for the weekend, like random weird, you know, hedonistic bullshit like that. It's way easier. And when, when we're just playing distracted, right? It's way easier for big institutions to just take huge swaths of control of our life away, right? Like when you choose to live in a city, you're giving away a huge, huge amount of your freedom for convenience, like we're just talking about. And, you know, any sort of, any sort of disruption to that potential convenience is just, is, you know, is the ends of the earth for some people. And you know what I wanted to mention earlier when he's talking about how we've outsourced the protection of our goods to like the government and the lawmakers and that also what people don't understand especially like a lot of quote-unquote right-wing people is that why are you so beholden to things like every time something unjust happens people's like that's unconstitutional like why do you care so much about the constitution honestly like it has some truth in it but is it everything Like, it's so funny because, like, I think we're, like, we're naturally, like, taught to, like, man, everything starts and ends with the Constitution. But there's more ideas out there than just that and ways to take society better. It's like, why are you so beholden to this, right? Because you've outsourced the Constitution to the protection of your rights and your freedoms. As yeah, opposed to yourself said, and your community being the protectors of your rights and your freedoms and your tribe and your village, your family being the protectors of your rights and your freedoms and your property. Yes. You know, and it's like the people who are changing the world don't care about the constitution at all. They completely ignore it. But yeah. you're sitting here playing within yeah. the rules. Yeah. I, mean, with, I, I think about like trusting this. The legal, I think about like trusting this. the legal system and all this stuff. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, if 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 your if your enemy is going to play outside of the rules, then how can you expect to win inside the rules? Right. It's like you, just like you, you have people at, think at that point you have to assert. You have to assert outside that is not okay. You don't have to like you don't have to like burn everything down, but you have to make it clear like, oh, you're going to go outside the rules. I'm gonna I'm gonna one up you outside the rules, and we're gonna come back inside these, or else it's gonna get really nasty. Right. We need new rules in general. The old rules yeah. didn't work. Yeah. They didn't exactly. Work, right. We need, we need rules. new rules you're, and you're less rules. You're not gonna fucking vote your way out of this. No. There's no political no. candidate that can come in. First of all, no one that really has the this thinking the way we think is gonna be any up for any sort of public office that's not going to happen they're not going to be the democratic nominee or the republican nominee because that's not how our political system works so that person isn't isn't coming to save us from within the structure the person that would lead us the right way would do it outside of the already established structure the established structure right listen to the statistic right here There are at least 5,000 federal criminal laws with 10,000 to 300,000 regulations that can be enforced criminally. Like that's insane. How do you, how do you, how do you go through life? Like I I heard this stat too, like at at any given time we're, we're breaking like 15 laws, like everybody's breaking laws and it's just ridiculous. Like how do you, you, you can't have a, you can't have a sane functioning society with that. Right. It's, 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 it's insane. It's a, not to mention, not to mention all the, all the, the unspoken social laws. And it makes to, it, it makes a society nerve. of trickery. Yes. There's fine yes. print on everything and where people are always trying yeah. to remove themselves of liability for things and people don't take responsibility for their own actions. Like the beginning of the lawsuit was a huge point in like 
the decline in cultural standards. Because then people are like looking for different ways to cut corners or for yeah. ways to hide the Ill, the the bad side of things. You know, like it the like the word your word isn't tied to anything anymore. It's not tied to your name or your honor. Your word just has to align with the law. Which means yeah. it doesn't have to always be true. Right, which is you know the, the the worst the worst thing you can do is equate the law with morality. Which if that's your case, right, and that's oh, that's, that's what's happened. That's kind of what he's talking about here. Is like law is seen as like morality. If it if it works in court, you know, it's like everybody's hoping that these mandates get turned down at the Supreme Court. That's not what's going to save you. Like what's going to save you is you being self reliant. And finding ways where you just don't have to comply no matter what. Like you're waiting right. for, like everybody was trusting the plan, waiting for judges to try to reverse the election. Like, <laughs> no, the only way that was going to have the, anything would get reversed is if people took it by strength. Yeah. Yeah. Which is yeah. why they were so scared yeah. about the January 6th thing, because it's the first time people actually start doing, taking things into their own hands and not relying on the law or the Constitution to protect them. And and Owen Benjamin talked about the the the, the one six thing. I'm gonna call it the one six thing because I don't know if YouTube will flag <laughs> this or whatever. But I'm gonna call it the one six thing because he he talked about how it's it's really really stupid to storm a government building and then not have a plan to take it over. Yeah. <laughs> like 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 if you're not gonna take over the government, then you're you're literally wasting everybody's time and you're just gonna you know it's just gonna you know. Patriot Act 2.0 is basically going to come from that. Yeah, so, they're just going to use it as an example in the future. Yep, exactly. Which is exactly what, what, what has happened with all those guys. And I mean, Emerson kind of caps off with what we were just talking about at, at, right at the end. You know, a political victory, a rise of rents, the recovery of your sick or the return of your absent friend or some other favorable event raises your spirits and you think good days are preparing for you. Do not believe it. <laughs> Nothing can bring you peace but yourself. Nothing can bring you peace but the triumph of principles. That's the last line in the work. And I think that sums it up perfectly. Yeah, that's great. And, you know, there's one line right before it that I also love where he says, a man who stands on his feet is stronger than a man who stands on his head. <laughs> you know, stand on, your feet, stand on your actions. Don't just That's, don't just stand on theory and, and guessing. Yes, yes, yes. And I mean, everybody knows. Everybody who's done things to strengthen their principles knows this. Literally, nothing in the world, not even like the greatest orgasm, not even the greatest like million dollar check hitting or account. None of these things even touch the feeling of enforcing your principles. None yes. of them. It's it's the most it's like it, the high, the high you get with the feeling you get, you get this, you get this inner elation and like this, like this thing of, it's like you, 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 may, you feel, you feel so aligned with your intuition. You feel so aligned with, with yourself. And it's like for, for that one moment, for that one moment, there was no demon in you for that one moment. They, 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 they could not touch you. Nothing makes me feel better than doing it. What's right. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Like this is, and you can do. You can start small. You can start small, everyone. You don't need to like go out and start like reshaping your local government or something like that. You can start small, but holding your principles is if key. anything. It's not letting jobs treat you in a shitty way. It's not letting yeah. women walk all over you. It's not letting people direct your life in any sort of way. Standing on your principles. That's going to make you feel like more of a man than anything else. You yep. know, look at um, Amen. look at Dave Chappelle. Someone I don't I agree with some of what he says and all of it, but Comedy Central when he had the Chappelle show, they tried to screw him over with a deal, right, and offer him way less money than he's worth. And what do you do? He walked away, and then he comes back yep. years later, gets a huge bigger deal with Netflix, and has more leeway than most comedians now. Like can yep. actually say some yep. things, and why? Because he stood behind his principles. This is why people keep losing because they'll sacrifice the, who they are to get to where to where right. they want to be. 
but it doesn't actually take them yeah. to the place they want to be. It's a false. It's a false. Um, um, it's a total destination. Scam. It's a total scam. It's like a mirage. Yes. 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 That 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 happens so much with Hollywood types, with just everybody, just everybody. If you if you if, if you take one step outside of your principles, just there are no shortcuts. There's no shortcuts because every shortcut, quote unquote, you take will just come back and burn you. Every shortcut cuts away a piece of your soul. Yeah, yeah, it cuts you shorter, right? He, Emerson was talking about men of height, right? Yep, and. It cuts you away. A shortcut, what does it do? It cuts you short. It cuts you shorter from your potential. And so, yeah. Wow. There we go. We went through self-reliance. We actually ended up going through the whole thing. We were both just going to try to keep it to a couple simple excerpts, but the whole thing is just worth digesting. And I, I'm, I'm sure I'm going to read this at least a dozen more times in my life. You know, yep, especially since my and, kids would be writing book reports on this kind of stuff. Oh yeah, no, give give my kids this new life. Write an essay. R- write your thoughts down on this bucko. Yeah, but I would recommend everybody go. Uh, you know, it's only what is it? Twenty it's pages. Like, it's only twenty-one like, pages. It's 20, 20, 21 pages. It is so dense. It's one of those things that you like. Like Global said, you can read this ten more times, right? You can you, you can reread this all the time and you'll find new things and you'll it's like the bible you just you'll just deepen your understanding um this is the first book the first work of emerson that we've done we're uh we're still thinking about which one we're going to bounce on to next we're probably gonna stay focused on this series of essays that he's doing such as uh history compensation the oversoul and, and, and much more um yeah we'll be back in uh, I don't know when, but we'll be back very soon. Once we've uh, once we once we've decompressed from all of this, and we'll uh, put our heads together, we will uh, come back to the forest and explore a bit more of what uh, of what Emerson was trying to teach us. Lobo, do you have anything else you have to add? Uh, no, I just hope this uh, podcast is like Emerson wanted his books to be, and he said his books should smell of pine and resound with the sound of insects so i hope that's what this podcast does i hope it i hope it enlightens that uh the spirit inside you and you know you uh you can get in touch with that intuition and feel that need to go out into the world and and you know live live in a truthful way yeah you know be self-reliant Believe in yourself, learn to listen to your inner voice and your intuition that's speaking to you. Learn to act on it. Learn to take the lead on things. Learn to be your point of origin for reality so that you're not constantly being sucked into other people's gravitational pull. Let the world and everyone else orbit around you. And when things are orbiting around you, you're a sun, and then you're going to shine bright into the world and into others. And remember to always constantly be advancing on chaos in the dark. A man's job is to go and put order to things because we live in a world, nature is the perfect orderly chaos. And what we do as men is we go and add order to things. And we go into the dark and we shine our torches into it and we make things lighter. So that's what you have to be constantly focused on living in a way that allows you to respect yourself and forces other people to respect you as well. And standing strong against evil and the bad things that you see. Don't get, take care of yourself and get yourself sorted out first but don't stay on the sidelines, you know, especially if you have people that you love and you care about and that you want to protect, you have a duty and a responsibility Mm -hmm. to fight for them and to lift the veil for them and to become the sun for them and, and, and be a rock for them so that they have someone else that they can rely on that 
allows them to see that their inner voice is telling them the truth and is showing them something and give them the confidence to be that person that cross the street too, or to be that person that starts dancing as well. So I hope all of this helps you guys and I'm excited to do more. I'm, I really just actually getting, I enjoy just getting to read these texts and like go over them over and over again. So uh, I'm excited for whatever one we decide to do next and I hope you enjoyed listening.